the stress hormones not only uh, damage cells in the hippocampus, they damage your microbiota in the gut. In a very important sense, you've reversed the functional aging of the brain. They're also really incredibly important for brain function. They literally supercharge your brain. One of the many myths that I try to bust in The Changing Mind is that uh, you can't grow new neurons after a certain age, or you can't make new neural connections. Neuroplasticity, the buzzword for making new neural connections, new synapses, that goes on your entire life. And the more you can learn, especially new things, the more neuroprotective it is because you're building up neural and cognitive reserves. So... That could be anything though, right? You Just learning anything, whether it's music or sport or... Absolutely. You know, but is a it... A new language. So this sounds like one of the key things we need to be thinking about as we get older is what, keep trying new things? Yeah, and in particular, there's this new appreciation for what we call embodied cognition. Uh, Barbara Traversky and Scott Grafton both have new books out about this. Scott's is called Physical Intelligence. Uh, fantastic books. The idea is that your body actually helps your mind grow through the experiences you have manipulating your body. So learning a new language is neuroprotective, but learning something that involves eye-hand coordination, um, musical instruments being one, not so much singing, but playing an instrument, or, or taking up tennis, or, or ping pong, or you know anything that involves this kind of body intelligence. Very powerful is simply going for a walk on an uneven trail. As you probably know, some Scottish doctors are now writing prescriptions yeah. for their patients. Go for a walk outside. You know, uh, it's because as you're walking on an uneven surface, your foot and your ankle and your legs are and your vestibular system are making dozens of micro adjustments every minute. Uh, you have to change the pressure and the angle and you have to get feedback about what's happening so you don't fall over. And it's hugely important. So would you say that, you know, would you therefore not be recommending as people age that they work out in a gym, on a treadmill, or on an exercise bike? Or can you do a bit of both? Well, you can certainly do a bit of both. Uh, I've, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I've changed a few things in my own life. One was I didn't know about sarcopenia. How would I? As I say, I, I basically know about stuff from the chin up uh, and a little bit of spinal cord. But sarcopenia is to muscle what osteoporosis is to bone. And um, so I've started doing resistance training. I go to the gym. I'm not trying to bulk up like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I do a round of 20, I'm sorry, 12 different weight machines just to keep my muscles going. I spend about 40 minutes there four or five times a week. Jane Fonda has started, told me she started doing the same thing. Um, do you enjoy I, it? I do. I do. I can't, I couldn't tell you why, but I do. And I also do the elliptical because I'm trying to get my heart rate up and I do what's called high intensity interval training. But better than both of those really is the difference between sedentarism and moving outdoors. If you only do one thing, you should move outdoors. But yeah, adding the others is great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great because... There's a lot of information we're giving people and sometimes getting too many things to do, too many things that are great to do, can sometimes seem a bit overwhelming. You have to prioritize. Now, if you're in a wheelchair, get somebody to take you out. The visual stimulation of being in nature is neuroprotective, not as much as if you're walking. And if you can push your own wheelchair, even better, or yeah. walker. Yeah. Now, Dan, you've got a long history in music, haven't you? You're a music producer as well? Yes. Yeah. And I heard you on an interview recently talk about you had the opportunity to meet Sting once and you scanned his brain. Yeah. So I'm interested, you know, Sting, well, I don't know how old Sting is, but... He's a few years older than me. I'm 62. I think he's 67-ish. Yeah. So look, I haven't seen a picture of Sting for a while, but the last time I saw him, certainly there's no way I would have guessed that he was in his late 60s. It's clearly someone who seems to be aging very well. So... Sting has a lot of practices, certainly that come across in the media that we read about. How many of those are true? That I don't know. But when the you... tantric sex is not true, for example, it's not true. No. Okay. Um, 
Do you know what he does? I do. I do. Um, Sting had read This Is Your Brain on Music, and he reached out to me at some point in 2007 or eight and said he wanted to visit the lab and meet me and talk about the findings. And so he came to Montreal, and I said, you know, while you're here, if you want, we can scan your brain and we can, you know, see what it looks like. Um, It wouldn't be an actual study. I guess it's a case study, but not a proper experiment. Uh, and he was into it. And, uh, you know, we, we found that his corpus callosum is thicker than most people's. That's the fiber track that connects the left and the right hemisphere. And we often see thicker corpus callosi in people who are very creative, who are shuttling information from the left to the right hemisphere. Um, we learned some things about how he organizes music in his memory that were quite novel. We published a paper about it, Scott Grafton and I, the embodied cognition guy, in a, a journal called Neurocase. It's available for free on my website, as all my peer-reviewed papers are. Okay, great. Um, and we'll link to all of them sure. uh, as well in the show notes section so people can easily find that. Uh, I mean, it is an article written for other scientists, but I think that the average person could glean the, the punchline from it. Uh, and then he, uh, we, we kind of got, lo- got, a- got along well, and he invited me to come and tour with him and the police reunion tour for a few shows. You've got to be kidding me. It was terrific. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. And so I did get to see what his life is like. Uh, he does yoga every afternoon. He has, uh, you know, for at least a couple of hours, sometimes four. He uh, earmarks alone time apart from the yoga to either practice something musically or learn a new song or uh, or write something just to experiment around. He gives himself play time to play every day when he's on tour. And then the other extraordinary thing was, we were talking about conscientiousness. I've never met anybody with the work ethic that he has. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a, a professor. I know a number of Nobel Prize winners. Most of the professors I know are workaholics. We work 75, 80 hours a week. That's nothing compared to what Sting does. He is working all the time. He enjoys himself, uh, but he, his work ethic, just to give you an example, I asked him, how is it that you play bass and sing at the same time? I'm a bass player. That's very difficult to do because sure. it's not like strumming a guitar or finger picking where everything's in sort of lockstep time. Bass parts tend to be syncopated. You're not, you're not always singing when the bass hits a note. You're sometimes yeah. singing in between notes and in odd inter- integer ratios. Uh, and so just as, as a demonstration of work ethic, I said, how do you do it? He says, well... He says, when I know that I'm going to go out on tour and I'm going to have to play these songs in the studio. Yeah, you can track it differently. Yeah, he played the bass first, he sang second, or vice versa. If he's going to have to do it live. So he writes out on a piece of paper the lyrics and the the chords or the notes. And he writes a kind of visual map for where the vocal note is versus the bass notes. Sometimes they're synchronized, sometimes they're anti-phase. And then he'll sit down and he'll practice one measure at about one-fifth the normal tempo. And he might do that for half an hour, that one measure. And then he'll put it away and go to another song, and the next day he'll come back and he'll add another measure. And he says it could take him six months to work up a tune at the proper tempo. And I thought, oh my God. Is it it a bit like, you know, some... Again, I'm not trying to compare the two, but just to sort of make it really relevant for people at home who maybe are not musical or don't play the bass and have never tried to play the bass and sing at the same time. You know, like, I'm sure it's the same in America. We have the thing where you have to try and um, patch your stomach and, sorry, you know, uh, put your hand around your stomach and patch your head at the same time, which some people find quite hard to do unless you... But I think most people, when they focus on it and practice... Well, it requires what we call limb independence. Yeah. So is there something similar to that that's going on with Sting when he's trying to just teach him, maybe not limb independence, but, you know, voice and hand independence? Yeah. And and we find this in a lot of activities. Flying an airplane requires limb independence. You're using both feet, you're using both hands. Um, One of the things I did in order to... uh, uh, 
adopt the advice that I gave others in the book is that I realized I had to push myself out of my comfort zone. And so I took flying lessons and studied for my private pilot's license because it is very complicated. It's not like playing drums. So, so a, you're doing this to help you age better. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, Bec I, because it's a new skill and it's, it's sort of taxing your brain you're, and your brain's having to fire up different neurons. Yeah. Is that in a nutshell, what it is. It's exactly that. It was taxing my brain in ways I hadn't taxed it before. Yeah. Not only that, but I'm, I'm terribly afraid of heights. And yeah. so it was a way for me to get some agency over my own yeah. uh, feelings in life. I mean, I find if we, if we just go back to Sting for a second, what I find really interesting is you started off talking about Sting and saying that he, he makes sure he does some yoga every afternoon, sometimes for two hours, sometimes for three or four hours. He ensures that he's got some time alone. Mm -hmm. And then you followed that up by saying he's one of the most, if not the most productive and conscientious people you've ever had the, had the opportunity to meet. Yeah. And so a lot of people, that won't make sense. It will be like, hold on a minute. How can he be conscientious and hardworking when he's got time to do yoga in the afternoon and he's got time to spend an hour by himself each day? Unless, of course, those are things that help him be productive and conscientious. Well, it's exactly that. Uh, it's if if I don't go to the gym in the morning, um, it, there's always this tension that I, I like you probably. I'm oh, I'm way behind in my work. I'll never catch up, no matter what I do. And I always feel that if I take 15 minutes off, I'll fall 30 minutes behind. And so when I wake up in the morning, do I go to the gym and and basically lose 45 minutes? Well, for me anyway, if I do, I gain that back later in the day in terms of productivity. I get more done in an hour of work if I've had that. And Sting must have worked out that these things um, help keep him on an even emotional keel and help inspire him to, to do his best. You know, the whole Sting story um, reminds me of something else that maybe your listeners will be interested in. I saw this fantastic magic trick. It was the um, it was the signature trick of a guy named Glenn Falkenstein who's passed away, and I saw it several times. And what he does is he goes into a a, a room, you know, it's usually a concert hall or a venue, and um, he's on the stage, and his assistant uh, puts some uh, silver dollars over his eyes, and then wraps them with uh, plastic, and then puts on uh, some sort of uh, um, thing to block his, his vision even more. Uh, and um, then she goes out in the audience and she asks somebody um, to, without saying what they're doing, pull something out of their pocket or their purse or off their table and hold it up. Uh, and so I was a... a I was a participant in this a couple of times. I, I love this trick. Uh, one time I pulled out a credit card and she says to him, uh, okay, uh, you, you know, th this person is ready. Do you, do you know what he has? And, the, and Glenn says, well, it's a credit card. And she says, okay, what else can you tell us about it? And he says, well, it's a visa. It's not a MasterCard or a diner's club or an Amex. She says, what else? Uh, can you tell us anything else? He says, well, it's the Chase Bank. And she says, okay. Uh, and um, she says, and uh, now I'm wondering if you can read off the numbers, the 16 digits. And he does in groups of four. After each one, she says, keep going or, you know, uh, that's right. Uh, what's next? You know, these kinds of things. Um, now, I imagined that this was a super high-tech trick, that she's got a hidden camera in her hand, and the reason for all of this stuff around his eyes, that he's got some kind of a screen, or maybe he's got an earpiece, and somebody is, you know, talking into his ear. Um, he can read off the serial number of a dollar bill. People pull out a lipstick. He can tell you it's an Estee Lauder, and it's this color, and it's, it's amazing. And so, right before he retired... I asked him how he did the trick. And of course, magicians aren't supposed to tell you, but he had retired. Um, he worked on that trick with his assistant for five years. Everything she says is code. When she says, 
this person's ready, that means it's a credit card. She says, are you ready to start? That means it's a bill of some sort. If she says, um, okay, let's go, that means it's a piece of silverware. It's the most elaborate code you can imagine. And they memorize it. It took them five years of working on this two hours a day. But in the end, I mean, to me, that, it's a marvel of conscientiousness and, and, and work ethic. But in the end, they had this amazing trick that nobody can figure out. I mean, it's incredible to hear that. And it's, it's incredible to hear the capacity of the human brain. Um, it's incredible to hear that story, Sting story, and just think how hard and how dedicated some people are to mastering their craft. And then I'm always thinking about how can I bring that back to someone who's out on a run at the moment, who's listening to this, who maybe like the title of the podcast thought, oh, how I'm going to age well. And then what can they take from that into their own life? And I guess it's as you said right at the start, you know, the number one trait that's going to help you age well is conscientiousness. So I guess, can you finish a task you started? Is and that- can you, and can, and not only that, but can you do the best possible job you can? Can you do not just good enough? Can you try to push yourself to do more, to do better? Um, can you... Can you grow in whatever it is that you're doing, if it's keeping a garden, um, if it's cooking for yourself and your family, if it's choosing vegetables, learning which ones to choose at the market so you get the most flavorful and healthy ones with the most nutrients, any area of a human endeavor where you can learn and keep learning is what's neuroprotective. And um, I mean, it's fun. It is fun. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it, it's it's curiosity, really, which is a separate trait. It's number two on the list after conscientiousness. Is it really? People who are curious do better in life. So conscientiousness and curiosity, the two C's yeah. of aging well. Right. And, you know, with this book, like all my other books, the version of it that got published was uh, roughly uh, version 52. That is, I wrote the manuscript, I went back over it and rewrote it entirely 52 times. I've never published anything that I uh, had fewer than 12 revisions on. And those tend to be short articles or scientific papers where it's, uh, you know, there's a formula, but for, you know, for the books or for the New Yorker articles or things like that, it's always 40 or 50 drafts. And I have this friend named Mike Lankford, who is, is I th- the best writer I know. He published a wonderful book that I think you'd like called Life in Double Time. Okay. About his uh, early years as a drummer in a touring band that nobody's ever heard of, but oh, wow. it's it's hilarious and insightful. And then he wrote another book, which is both of the two of my favorite books of all time. The other one is Becoming Leonardo. It's a biography of Da Vinci. It's so much better than Walter Isaacson's uh, bio, which came out at the same time. And I said to Mike, um, your books are so amazing. How many drafts for becoming Leonardo? He said 75. He worked on it 10 years. That's a masterpiece. It couldn't be any better. Um, I have much to learn. And I guess all of these stories, whether it's your friends there or yourself, just the act of you writing this book, forget about your other ones for a minute, just this book and doing 52 or so revisions, that is conscientiousness, that is dedication, that is actually, I guess, helping you to age well. Well, and it's curiosity. I'm curious to know what I can do to make it better. I'm yeah. curious to know if there's a... Uh, you know, after our conversation, I'm going to go re- take notes because I get a chance between now and the paperback to do another few revisions. Yeah. And in stimulating conversations like this, I always think, well, there's probably something I can take and yeah. change it for the better. And it's interesting. I mean, as we record this, Dan, I mentioned just before we went on air, my 100th episode of this podcast has probably gone live whilst we've been chatting. Congratulations. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's again, something that started off as an idea um, just over two years ago. 100. Yeah, episode 100 goes One out. a week. One, yeah, pretty much one a week. Uh, I have taken August off the last uh, two years because, you know, for me, I've got two young kids. They're off in August. I want to just switch off and be able to spend proper quality time with them when they're off school. So, um, you know, I, I, I've done that the last couple of years. But what's interesting for me is the feedback we get, the way it, it's grown so rapidly. And 
the fact that people say, oh, look, each week it's, it's, there's such a varied guest. I'm learning new things. It's making me think about my life in a different way. I can't wait for the next one. I'm really curious for what's coming next. So I guess I'm thinking, or I'm certainly hoping that actually people who listen to this podcast each week with that curiosity, maybe in some way this is helping them to age well. Oh, I hope so. I, I believe so. If, if you can remain curious and learn new things, that's neuroprotective. It doesn't mean that you won't get Alzheimer's or that you can reverse it or slow it down, but it does mean, based on the research, that you may get it and nobody would notice it for years because you've built up this cognitive reserve. Think of it this way. If you go to the gym and you can bench press uh, 200 kilos, on a bad day, you could still do 50. Uh, I can't, but you've got some muscle reserve. Same thing with the brain. You, you build up this reserve through doing new things, whatever they are. Just to bring this full circle, um, the other a third quality that we can all work on is gratitude. Yeah. Um, I, as you, as you, as you know, I had the opportunity to meet with the Dalai Lama yeah. in doing the research for the book, and he meditates on gratitude and compassion two to four hours every day. And he believes the real secret to happiness, not necessarily longevity, but happiness, is to embrace gratitude. If you're happy for what you have, and you're not focused on what you don't have, and feeling slighted or carrying around anger and such, uh, and how come so-and-so has a Tesla and I don't, or you know, so-and-so got promoted and I didn't, so-and-so spouse is better looking than mine, all of that stuff... Uh, throws our brain into a kind of fear mode. It activates the amygdala. It releases cortisol. But, you know, Warren Buffett agrees. Yeah. The idea of experiencing gratitude. My grandmother was a an immigrant to the United States from Germany, a Holocaust survivor. Uh, she escaped the Nazis. And she had written out on a piece of paper uh, the things she was grateful for. Yeah. And she recited them every morning when she woke up and every night before she went to bed. She was not religious, but we were talking about how you could affect change. And we talked about meditation and medication and psychotherapy. Another thing that works is religion. All the world's religions teach you that you can change yourself. You can become more compassionate or generous or yeah. more tolerant or uh, express more gratitude. So she had this list and she told us that every day she woke up, she told me, my, me and my mom around the time she was 79, that she sang God Bless America every morning. God Bless America, written by another immigrant, by the way, Irving Berlin, another Jewish immigrant. And she felt that it was her purpose to do that. She had to express gratitude that her family was saved. So for her 80th birthday, my mother and I bought her a little $80 electronic keyboard. And I got pieces of masking tape and put them on the keys to play the song. And I put numbers on them. Oh, wow. So she'd know what order to play them in. And she loved it. She'd never played an instrument before. So she's going one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, like this. Uh, and then by the time it was her 81st birthday, she had lifted the masking tape off and was playing it from memory. By her 82nd birthday, she'd worked out a rudimentary harmony with the left hand. Oh, wow. She kept improving. She did this every single morning and every night before she went to bed until she died at 97. And we found the keyboard on her bed table. Wow. But you're a neuroscientist, and I know from doing some research on you that you have studied a lot of things about stress and depression and its impacts on particular parts of the brain, including the hippocampus. And that's an area that, that can get affected quite powerfully by walking. And what if you could expand? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think one of the great discoveries of the of our rediscoveries of the last kind of couple of decades in neuroscience is the realization that the brain is a muscle or functions like a muscle. Uh, it's plastic. If you work it, uh, it changes dynamically in response to, to what you do to it. If you leave it, 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 it tends to atrophy. So uh, the parts of the brain that are concerned with learning and memory uh, is a part of the brain called the, the, the hippocampal formation. It's also the same part of the brain that's involved in the processing of information about stress. Uh, and it's also very badly affected by depression. And here's 
I think one of the amazing discoveries uh, we now know with absolute certainty as, as certain as we know anything in science that lots of aerobic exercise getting out and moving walking lots materially affects the volume of the hippocampal formation it gets bigger as the result of, of uh, exercise and the functions it supports get better as a result of uh, exercise. And you can demonstrate this in all sorts of ways. We've done studies, for example, with um, uh, sedentary uh, college students, and we've made them do forced exercise regimes on bicycles, on, on, on exercise bikes, and shown that uh, molecules that are expressed in the brain, uh, which, which float into the blood, uh, including brain-derived neurotrophic factor, go up, and memory in these students goes up. But even more dramatically, um, this capacity is retained right throughout life. So it's never too late. So I, I, I'll, I'll just pick on, on one very important study. Art Kramer's group in Chicago have taken uh, a group of uh, about 120 people in their early 70s, divided them into two groups, one who were just left to live their life as uh, randomly into two groups. They live their life as they always live it. And uh, the other group are brought out for a walk three times a week. That's all for about a mile and a half with a physiotherapist in small groups, groups of, of two. And uh, they're followed for a year or so. And what you see is in the walking group, improvements in memory, improvements in attention, an increase in the volume of the hippocampal formation, uh, an increase in the amount of this amazing substance, BDNF, in the blood. And uh, the 72-year-olds start to perform on psychological tests at the same level as 68-year-olds do. So in, in a very important sense, you've reversed the functional aging of the brain. Whereas the other group who just continue their sedentary telewatching lifestyle, they continue on a pathway of decline. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. And, and I like the, the point you're making, but it's never too late. That's the important thing. Uh, and I, I like to suggest uh, that uh, you only get old when you stop walking. You don't stop walking because you're old. Yeah. And I guess walking, and I, I'm thinking about um, you know, people in my family now, walking is something, I, I think this is actually part of the problem as well. And one of the reasons why I think you had to write this book is it's such a simple thing. Or is it, you know, we can, we can discuss whether it's simple or not. Um, but it is, it's something that many of us don't think about. We just put one foot in front of another and we're walking. So we don't give it maybe the credence that it deserves. And we don't, we don't probably recognize its importance yeah, but I think until we was, lose it. What you've said, though, is the key point that we don't think about it. We just put one foot in front of the other. And that's the point, I think, that has gone wrong in how we've engineered our modern world. We've made it easier for the default to be to get into your car. What we should do is at all of the points of the day, whenever you're moving around, we should make it easy for you to just put one foot in front of the other without thinking about it. Yeah. That's what we need to do. Yeah, it, it's it's mind blowing, and um, as you as you're as you're describing all these benefits, I'm, I'm thinking back to the. I, I I went to Nairobi in 2011 for the first time. I'd never been to Africa before, never been to Kenya, and my wife's uh, father, so my father-in-law, has a lot of his family living out there, and they are Jains, and it's really interesting that. You know, the environment in Nairobi is certainly not set up for walking. It's a lot of it's a busy city yeah. with lots of cars, but this Jain community they have a center. And every evening at sort of dusk time, everyone in the community seems to congregate there. And for about an hour, they've got this track. They all walk together for an hour together, just in, I wouldn't say in meditative silence, but it's a very quiet, it's a very reflective time. And, and because it's done in a community, because there's other people there, I think it attracts people. So they come each day. And I guess there's social connection, they're seeing your your friends, your family, but there's something about that daily walking together, uh, which is which is extremely powerful, I think. And you, you, and you see this in Italy. Uh, in Italian towns, they have uh, uh, the wonderful phenomenon of the passeggiata. Right. Uh, at seven or eight o'clock in the evening, in these car-free centers, people come out for a walk around together. It's an amble. They talk to each other. They see each other. Uh, if you go to uh, some of the, the uh, uh, squares in Rome, you'll see it happening, but you particularly see it in, in the smaller towns. Uh, it's, it, it happens in Sicily and it, it's, it, 
I think, you know, you're, you're hitting on something really important there that this time that we can gather and chat and talk uh, free from the clamor of the day. And we can have also this wonderful thing, companionable silence. Yeah. Um, it really gives you a great opportunity. Just, you know, sort things out in your head. Yeah. And I guess in many ways, it's never been more important than in the busy, distraction-filled 21st century in which we now live, where, you know, many of us... Uh, you know, anytime we have a bit of downtime, we pick up our phones, we're, we're consuming, we're reacting, we are, um, you know, we're not alone with our own thoughts. And I think there is something powerful about walking. I know you certainly talk about this. I've written about this in the past as well, about creativity and what happens when I was writing my books. And I'm, 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 I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would guess it was the same. If you're coming across writer's block, what do I do? Put everything down, go outside for a walk. You come back and before you know it, problem solved, yeah, right? you're recharged. Uh, yeah. I, and in fact, I, I wrote a lot of this book by making notes on a page of my, on pages of my kitchen table, numbering those pages, and then going out and walking with a dictaphone and uh, dictating it. And wow. what, what you often find, uh, apart from getting the weird looks uh, <laughs> as you're, you're going along, um, is that you talk uh, far past the notes that you've made and thoughts come to you that wouldn't have come to you had you been sitting at your keyboard. And then you end up with this big slab of text, which is, has too many pauses in it and yeah. all the rest of it needs to be edited. But uh, um, this is something that the, many of the great writers of the ages uh, have done. Um, you know, f philosophers like Immanuel Kant, for example, enormously productive. He would go and you could set the clock by him, apparently, in Regensburg. Um, 3 p.m. every day, he went for a two-hour walk and then he came home and he wrote. Uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, the uh, the great philosopher, uh, would uh, went for long walking holidays and enjoyed the feeling of of, of uh, not being in pain from thirty mile walks. But for his regular writing, he would get up, uh, make a few points on a page, go for an hour's walk, and then come back and compose. Stephen King, the novelist. Um, and his book on writing describes how uh, he goes for very long country walks before he starts writing every day. It really, really does help. Yeah. Do we know the mechanisms by which we become, you know, more creative and we can solve problems when we go out? We take a break and we go out for a walk. Do we know exactly what is going on there? So I think th th there are probably two or three different things going on here. So I think we have a misperception about how we problem solve. Uh, and we think problem solving is active. It's time on the task. It's banging your head against the problem. And actually, uh, when we look at how the brain uh, operates, we have what's known as a, a, a kind of a, a default mode, sometimes called the default mode network, where we're actually zooming back out. We're looking at kind of the bigger picture. And to do that, we're not engaged with the environment. And then we have what's called a task positive network, where we're focused on the thing. Um, and Creative problem solving happens best when you're able to flicker between these two states where you're, you're looking at the forest, then you're looking at the trees, and then you come back out, so you're searching for the pattern. And I have the suspicion, um, although I, I, I can't prove this, but I, I, I would hope uh, that we would be able to soon, that one of the things that happens when you're walking is that you're able to engage in kind of an uh, an active idle mode of thought where you can flicker in on the problem, focus back out from it, hone in on it again and come back in and out. And walking facilitates this kind of rhythmic uh, uh, focusing, defocusing on, um, on a problem. And I, I also think there's another thing going on. Um, when we're sitting, as we're doing now, our brain doesn't have to work very hard. Uh, it doesn't have to work to maintain posture. Uh, when we stand up, one of the first things you have to do, uh, or one of the first things you see is our blood pressure changes, our heart rate changes, our, our breathing changes. And the brain has the particular job of keeping you stable. Um, so there's a lot more activity going on. So I, th I think what's also happening when you're up and about, uh, more of the brain is active and ideas that would be kind of just below the level of yeah. consciousness previously are now just being brought above and into consciousness because the brain is a bit more active. Yeah. And you mentioned at one point in your book that actually when we walk, other senses are heightened. Yeah. Which yeah. I found you know, it, it kind of makes sense. I think what, what, a lot of it 
intuitively makes sense. But, it but was only re- when you say it. <laughs> only when you say it, exactly. You don't think about it. So what, yeah. what happens to all these other senses? Yeah, so again, you know, I think we've had this kind of view of how the brain works, which is, which is manifestly, when you think, again, when you say it out loud, it's wrong. Uh, we think about the brain as, as something that passively takes in information from the outside, does something to it, and then we engage in a motor movement. But actually, the world is too complex for us to do that. Uh, and instead, a better way of looking at the brain is that it's, it's kind of information hungry. It, it's uh, predicting things continually that are about to happen and it's searching for information about the world to allow us to predict what we're going to do next. Uh, and it, it's engaged in the generation of, of possibilities. And it does this all the time uh, when we're moving around. And if you, if you imagine, for example, you're a cat uh, imagine you're a mouse, uh, and I use this example in in, uh, uh, in the book. As a mouse, you don't want to get eaten. As a cat, you want to eat the mouse. Uh, so you're walking around, and your job as the mouse is to detect the presence of the cat. Um, and what you find in the mouse's brain when it's moving like that, uh, activity in its visual areas are heightened, activity in its um, areas that are concerned with, with hearing and all of those parts of the brain are, are heightened when it's in movement. They're not when it's not moving. And the same is true of the cat, uh, because when you're moving, that's how you're going to capture your prey. Uh, you, you don't capture your prey passively. If you're a cat, yeah. you're, you're a predator, you hunt. Uh, so it makes sense that uh, and, you know, again, think about humans on, out on the, the African plains uh, 100,000 years ago carrying a, a fairly small spear. Is that yellow thing moving over there an antelope? In which case I can go after it quickly. Or is it a tiger? And should I run away? Yeah. <laughs> or can I run away? You need to make these decisions really, really quickly. They have to be really, really fast. So a, a selection effect in favor of a brain that anticipates uh, what's about to happen makes a lot more sense. I mean, that that is incredibly um, deep on one level, because in, in many ways, what you've just articulated is saying that maybe if we're sat down all day, or we're certainly not walking, maybe our brain is only in first gear. And maybe to get into second, third, fourth and fifth gear, maybe we need movement, we need walking. So if we're living sedentary lives, if we're sat down in our car to get to work, if we're sat at a desk all day and we sit down to eat our lunch at our desk and we come back and we sit on the sofa in the evening, that for many of us, maybe our brains have not got out of first gear. No, no. And uh, the weird thing, of course, is that uh, sitting around all day is tiring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you come home after not having done uh, a day digging ditches, uh, you've been sitting yeah. at your computer and you're exhausted. And the reason you're exhausted is because uh, our bodies and brains need movement uh, in, and that ma- movement generates all sorts of wonderful molecules um, that feed back on our sense of well-being, that, that facilitate uh, good things in terms of our musculature, in terms of our heart rate, and in terms of what's going on in the brain. So actually, somehow we need to break this. Uh, I don't I don't have a solution for it, except to say that we, right at the outset, need to bake into design principles for work, for buildings, for all the things that we do. For schools? For schools, absolutely. Um, no question about it. The facilitating movement um, and uh, making sure that much more movement happens. The other thing, of course, we we have to do is is uh, honor sleep. You know, the the yeah. two things that uh, will do the best for your mental health and for your physical health is to get lots of walking in, get lots of proper quality sleep. Yeah, I, I don't deal with that in this book, but there are many excellent. I've dealt books with that in my too. So, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's a great point. It's yeah. such a good point. And again, you know. My wife and I, this summer, we reflected on a lot of things and our, our our children have moved school recently and it's a bit further away. So the natural tendency would be or would have been to drive there. And we've made a little bit of a vow in the family that we are literally going to be trying our very best every day to walk the kids to school, even though it's probably 25 minutes. I know that that, that is not long. You talk to a lot of people and they'll be like, you know, people all around the world walk way more than that to school every day. But it's guess... I guess it's how used we are to convenience and and quick, short car journeys. But we made a big difference. And I think you have shared some research that suggests actually if we walk prior to doing some sort of intellectual task, we perform it better if we have walked 
just before it. Yeah, and we perform it more creatively, uh, which is the other thing. We generate more ideas. So a very simple way of demonstrating that is, you know, to take a common household object like a a pen, for example, and I ask you to come up with as many uses for that as you can in the next three minutes. And you might come up with seven or eight uses. You might come up with 25 uses. Uh, people vary and reliably vary in in, in uh, this capacity, but it's a very good measure of creativity. Uh, knowledge workers, creative artists, uh, high-performing scientists will typically come up with many more uses for a common out object than, than uh, somebody who's not uh, working in those those kind of domains. But here's the rub. Um, for a hundred years or more, uh, psychology has explored creativity in people who come to a lab and sit down and do a creative task. Um, what psychology has not done is asked, what would happen if we got people to move prior to getting them to do a creative task? And what you find is that if you have people do a short period of movement, walk for five or ten minutes prior to them, generating these cre new creative ideas, they generate on average twice as many uh, after having walked uh, compared to those who are seated. And I, I, uh, the studies on this are very beautiful. They're very carefully controlled. There's one where they've uh, had people sit on a treadmill <laughs> on a chair and they've had them walk on the self-same treadmill. And again, you find the same thing coming through that walking either on the treadmill or walking around an environment, uh, you will on average generate about twice as many new ideas. Yeah. Now, here's the important thing. It's often suggested that creativity diminishes with age. Um, and that doesn't appear to be entirely true. Uh, but uh, what is certainly correct is that if you get elderly people or people who are older in their 70s to walk prior to uh, a creative idea generation, they will generate twice as many ideas as sedentary 20-year-olds who haven't walked. So it, I've already said it's never too late in terms of, of changing what happens in inside uh, your head as, as a result of walking. Uh, neither is it too late where creativity is concerned. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? You, we're, we're seeing benefits for our physical health, for our mental health, for our creativity. Um, how accessible is that? You know, walking before you do a task, you know, whether it's walking your kids to school, whether it's before we get in the office, whether it's simply a case of, you know, having a break at lunchtime where you go for a 10 or 15 minute walk. It is, it's not only that it's going to make you feel better, it's going to make you more creative. And so many of us are trying to actually become more creative, solve problems that we have in our lives, relationship problems, all kinds of things. It's always better after a walk. Yeah. So the trick, at least the trick I use uh, is write down the few bullet points of what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and that organizes your thoughts into a kind of a schema. And then just put it down and go for a walk and come back to it. Yeah, that's the way. So you uh, kind of almost signpost it to your brain. Right. These are the four the, or five the things, things that I need to, to worry about. On. And yeah. then you forget about and it. Just for, go for a walk. And, and, uh, and let your deeply clever brain, brain, brain do the do work, work for, for you. you. Yeah. yeah, incredible. And uh, if, if it hasn't worked as a result of the walk, sleep on it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's John Dos Passos, the novelist, uh, used to say whenever he had trouble with writing, he would let the committee of sleep solve the problem <laughs> for him. Um, and uh, it is clearly the case as well that for difficult problem solving, you know, uh, having a good night's sleep can often, not always, but can often facilitate the, the problem solving. And having had a good day of movement before sleep helps you sleep. Yeah, I, I think the, the powerful message for me in, in what you're talking about at the moment is that our brain is always trying to solve these problems for us if we allow it to. Yes. And it's very powerful what you said, that the two most important things we can do for our mental health is sleep well and walk lots. Yes. And they're things that actually really are available to so many of us. I know many people struggle uh, with their sleep and I think that the human being's default state is to be able to sleep. And generally speaking, I would say in, in my uh, many years of clinical experience, I would say that the majority of people who are struggling with their sleep are usually doing something in their lifestyle that they do not realize is affecting their ability to sleep at night. It's yeah. very, you know, you do get primary sleep disorders, but by and large, I think it's it's rare compared to the people who are who are struggling because 
you know, they're not moving enough or they're not switching off in the evening. You said that dementia is not a disease of old age. That's right. It's so important for people to get that because, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Professor Dale Bredesen um, in, in California. I don't, you, I'm sure you've seen some of Dale's work and some of his research. And, you know, he's said on many occasions that, you know, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia may be starting even 30 years before it shows up. Now, I'm not, you may or may not agree with that, but he is, he is sort of said that, that the idea being that when you get symptoms is not when this starts. This starts That's a right. long way before. And therefore, yeah. there's an opportunity, if we're aware of that, to start taking preemptive and preventive action, you know, in our 30s, in our 40s, in our 50s, right. not when we're suddenly getting the diagnosis at the age of 72, let's say. So right. I want to just hammer home that the, the, the things in your book that uh, are based absolutely in science in terms of what people can do, they're kind of relevant to everyone, particularly women, I would say no matter what your age, right? I agree with you. I, I completely agree on everything you said. Alzheimer's disease is not like you, you, you just all of a sudden catch a cold. Right? It's not like tomorrow you go to the doctor and boom, you have Alzheimer's disease. There's something that's been happening in your brain for a really, really long time that eventually leads to the symptoms, which again speaks to how resilient the brain is, how strong these brains we have are, because they can literally fend off a whole amount of pathology and insults and, and problems for years and years and years. And your ability and your brain's cognitive reserve of reserve right, against these insults is really largely based on the way you live your life. There is a genetic component. Our DNA is part of whoever we are, everything we are is involved in every bodily and neurological function. However, your medical report, heart, report card and your lifestyle matter just as much for the vast majority of people. Like even in patients with genetically determined Alzheimer's, even for those very rare patients who carry genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's, at a young age, there's evidence that things like exercise can really delay the onset of dementia. And for the vast majority of the population, over 98% of people do not carry this genetic mutation. So risk is really more about the interplay of factors like, sure, there are genetic risk factors, your genes are important, but your lifestyle is just as important, your environment is just as important, your medical health is just as important. And those are the things that we need to take care of pretty much as soon as we're aware that they're important. It's not like you're 50 and today you have to take care of your brain. No, this, this brain health should really be part of overall health. We should really start thinking about our brains as our best friends, yeah. And the part of us that needs nurturing and supporting that is doing so much for us, right? So I think it's really important that we make choices that really support the brain. And I, I usually like to say that I encourage everyone to think of their brains more like a muscle, right? There are things that you can do to make your brain stronger. You can exercise it properly. You can feed it properly. You can take care of it properly. And your brain will perform so much better for you. Yeah. At any age, either at any age. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to sort of get into this lifestyle piece because there's yeah. so much that people can do, uh, particularly the bit on movement as well, where less might be more for, for yeah. women, which I found really interesting and something I, I've been thinking about for, for some time as well. Um, before we do that, I wonder if we could deal with hormones and in particular mm -hmm. HRT, yeah. which is obviously a very hot topic it's a very divisive topic very from you as a neuroscientist looking through the lens of the brain yeah. and with all the work you've done what are your views on hormones and how they can be used to help brain health my views are that hormones are important and that the field has not developed the way that one would hope 
especially as far as our brains are concerned. And I, I could talk about this for days to just give you the full detailed picture. But I, I think the bottom line is that preventing Alzheimer's or minimizing the depression and anxiety is not the same as treating heart flashes, right? So we know that hormonal replacement therapy is very effective at reducing, minimizing, and in some cases completely eliminating heart flashes for women who can tolerate the medications. Some women are not eligible for hormonal therapy for menopause, but most women are. And that is something that has been shown to be successful for. Like HRT can really help with heart flashes, with osteoporosis, with vaginal dryness, especially for women who um, undergo a hysterectomy or oophorectomy, which is the surgical removal of the uterus and or the ovaries. Now, when it comes to brain health, things become really complicated because the research is just not there. There have been clinical trials that looked at whether or not hormonal therapy could prevent dementia, right? And they showed that it cannot in women older than 65. So they were looking at women who were like 15 years post-menopause, and they were given hormones at that point, which is too late. It's just too late to start. Now, more recently, two very large clinical trials um, tested the efficacy of hormonal therapy in women who were a little bit younger, so within five years of menopause, and they showed no adverse effects, but also no benefit for cognition. And I would argue that that is, again, too late. We were talking about the lock and the key, the key and the lock, ah, the analogy. And the timeline is very important because what happens in physiology is that this system where the hormone locks to the receptor is really age dependent. What happens to the receptors is that if you don't have hormones, blocking for a really long time, the receptor shuts down. It just closes. The lock is not longer a lock. It just turns into a piece of door. So if you try to get the hormones then, nothing is ever going to happen, right? Yeah. You need to have plasticity. You need to have the hormones and the receptors. If the receptors said, okay, sorry guys, too late. There's no point giving hormones. So what, what we're trying to do right now is to better clarify this window of opportunity for brain health. And the way that we need to do it is not just by theoretically putting women in a clinical trial, but we need to look at their brains. We need to probe the system. Are these receptors working or not? Are they active or not? Does it make sense to give you hormones at this stage in your life as a woman? Yeah. So I think this is missing. And it's hard for me to answer the question without... No the right information. Right now, the question is, we don't know. Maybe for some women, especially women, again, who, who do receive hysterectomies and oophorectomies prior to menopause, the current recommendation is to take hormones. Yeah. Because that's been associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease, a lower risk of osteoporosis, of heart flash, a lot of symptoms. For other women, the answer is that we don't quite know yet. So, so a couple of things there. So Again, I don't want to quote Professor Bradison because he's not here. And so I want to make sure I'm <laughs> uh, accurately describing uh, some of his work. But Dale very much takes a multi-pronged approach when he's yeah. trying to help a patient. So he's saying, you know, he... he you know, he, he would try and change seven, eight, nine different factors together rather than typically it's, we'll try this one thing. Does it work? No, that's shown. Doesn't work. We'll try something else. And... And again, there's pros and cons of things, but I quite like that method in terms of, it's not about trying to put everything onto one thing, it's doing multiple things. And I think mm -hmm. he was the first person who really tuned me into thinking, maybe this is maybe six, six years ago or so, that, oh, maybe women should be, well, not women should be, maybe some women would benefit from okay. taking estrogen mm -hmm. in some form through and after the menopause to not to withdraw that sort of trophic support to the brain. And I find that really interesting because, you know, 
as, as a husband, I was thinking, oh, well, when my wife gets to that stage. That's going to be rough. No, no. no <laughs> I thought no. you were worried about. <laughs> no, no. Oh, genuinely, it, well, it was more, oh, once you know that, you can't unknow it, right? So it's, it's, yeah. and it's like, well, should women be routinely taking that to, or, or should we be considering that with respect to brain health? Right. And then, you know, where I get conflicted in my head is that, you know, we, we've looked through the evolutionary lens before about what men and women used to do when our brains were evolving. So I don't know if you're familiar with any work on this. I, I'm not. You know, if you go to something like the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, for example, uh, hunter-gatherer tribe who are still living at their traditional lifestyles, right? In terms of their hunting, they're gathering, they're very much living these low-stress uh, lives that are out in harmony with nature. I, I wonder, you know, do they have a word for the menopause? Do they suffer menopausal symptoms in the same way? Right. It, you know, I don't, I don't know. I wonder if you've come across that at all, because I think that would be really interesting. It is really interesting. And, and we do know that the experience of menopause really changes a lot, depending on different cultures. Like in Asia, women do not report nearly as much discomfort as women in the United States of America. So I think, yes, there's a genetic component, but I think the lifestyle. Stress must stress. be huge, right? You, you know, <laughs> stress I, I, is you, huge. Yeah. You know, and and yeah. I want to dive into this, and this is probably a good time to get into stress. Yeah. I, I can say this is, you know, this is not a scientific trial, but in my clinical experience, a lot of my female patients who come in with significant menopausal symptoms also have high degrees of stress in their mm -hmm. life. Now, yeah. of course, Makes it, could sense that, to me. it could be that the symptoms are getting bad and are not getting treated, which causes a stress. I, yeah. I absolutely recognize that. Yeah. But when I've really tried to unpick lifestyles for a number of years before it, stress seems to play a really big role. And I think, as you've explained in the book with the pregnenolone steel, you know, there is yeah. a way that stress literally impacts and changes this kind of symphony of hormones in your body. So I wonder if you could expand a bit on stress and what that does to the brain. Sure. So stress can literally steal your hormones. And that's because cortisol, which is the main stress hormone, is in balance with your estrogens because they, the body uses the same molecule, pregnenolone, which you mentioned before, to make cortisol and the sex hormones. So if you're super stressed out, like chronically stressed, your body will necessarily have to shift production of cortisol by taking the pregnenolone away from your sex hormones. And then you're going through menopause so, or perimenopause, you're stressed out because you're a middle-aged woman with most likely a job, a family, elderly parents, you have no time for yourself, you're having hot flashes or you're not feeling well because of hormonal changes. And then you also have distress in your life and your hormones are going down further. So it really kind of turns into a vicious circle, right? Where the more stressed you are, the more symptoms you get. And who knows how we can stop it. But I think Sometimes hormonal therapy might be a gateway to break the cycle. Sometimes it's more about lifestyle. You know, there are things that we all can and should do to keep stress at bay. And that is so important, not just for hormones, but also really for brain health, because something we don't talk about enough, I think, as a society, is that too much stress is not only bad for your heart, it's also literally bad news for your brain. And there's this incredible study came out last year with hundreds, probably thousands of people who got brain scans and they were middle-aged, like 40 to 65. And what they showed is that if you have high cortisol levels, that really correlates with brain shrinkage already in midlife and with a worsening in memory performance. So high stress can really... Um, negatively impact your ability to recall information already when you're 50 years old. And what I thought was particularly scary is that the brain shrinkage, when they actually looked at gender, they found out that the brain shrinkage was only found in women who were postmenopause, 
which is again, you know, the gender bias. They didn't look at gender as a predictor. They were trying to remove the effects of gender, but then they realized that there was something really hard to get rid of. Yeah. And it turns out that it was the fact that only women and not men, only highly stressed women show brain shrinkage. I mean, th- this but is massive. You're, you're, you're basically saying that stress affects the brains of women differently, differently than yeah. the brains of men. That's right. It looks like men's brains are more resilient to stress, at least in midlife. And again, these studies are all the average, right? We're comparing the average man to the average woman. It tells you nothing about outliers and women who can tolerate stress beautifully and men who really suffer. But on average, women's brains tend to shrink in midlife when your, levels, when your stress levels are really high. And when you say midlife, are you specifically talking about... 65. What was that, sorry? 40 to 65. 40 to 65. So yeah, coming into that age of the perimenopause, I guess, yes. and, and beyond. Yeah. And I guess that really, that really begs the question for me, and I have, you know, men and women of all ages listening and watching this show. But if that really is the case, then in some ways that turning point to 40 <laughs> is quite a significant one in the sense of, look, you know, of course it's going to be different in different people. And of course these are just generalities and it's, you know, we can't say it's the same for everyone. But it's almost like saying, hey, look, between your 20s and 40s, you know, while you're building up life, you know, figuring out who you are, what you want to be, you know, tolerating all these kind of stressors, maybe there needs to be, again, like a step change in the way we view stress, particularly, let's say, for women at the age of 40, go, hey, look, maybe I could get away with it 20 to 40, but over the next 10, 20 years, I've got to be careful that... I take some time for myself. I take some time to switch off that I don't yeah. take on too much. So that, and I know it's hard because culture is pushing us away from this. And I think that's another big piece of the puzzle here, which we sort of touched on at the start, which is, you know, I think, I think, I think a lot of people have it tough in society, but I, I think women have got it super tough. You know, even in this pandemic, Lisa, I don't, I'm, I'm <laughs> yes, right we do. By, we, by we and do large, in my <sighs> network, right? And the patients yes. I've spoken to and in my network, and if I'm honest, in my house, women have taken on the bulk of the caregiving duties, the sort of childcare duties. Of course, it's not in every case. No, for sure. But I think that would be in- that, that I know has been incredibly stressful for, m- it is stress, for, for yes. many women. For sure, for sure. You know, we, we, <laughs> we got six months of lockdown. I thought it was going to lose my mind. Um, but it, it's hard regardless of pandemics, I think. Yeah. And it's really, it's really about you being able to deal with stress because there's always going to be something that is stressful in your life. Right now, everything is pretty much more difficult but there's always going to be stresses for everyone and i think it's really important to start looking at strategies to reduce stress and really make it part of a culture which is it's not part of our culture right now in some schools kids are being taught yoga and meditation which i think is phenomenal i wish i had it yeah. I learned to meditate by myself. Actually, Dr. Rudy Tanzi yeah. taught me into that as soon as I moved to New York. And that really changed my life. I thought he was like, kind of, was like, excuse me, <laughs> I'm a scientist. So were you and skeptical? Was, this is interesting. So as a scientist, you were skeptical. Oh my God, of course. Yeah, for sure. Yoga. Mm. I love both and they have an incredible, incredible beneficial impact on the health of my brain for sure. But also now we have actual clinical studies showing that they really change the functionality of your brain if you do it consistently enough and according to specific traditions or specific practices. And one practice that I describe in the book is the um, Kirtan Kriya, which is a form of Kundalini yoga but it's actually a meditation that's been scientifically proven in clinical trials to improve blood flow to the brain 
reduce cortisol levels and improve memory function specifically in women during midlife and after. And it's an 11 minutes meditation that is very, you probably are I've familiar. Done it. Yeah, yeah. I, you're done. I, had some, I had some Kundalini yoga classes last year uh, with my wife, actually. We had this nice. uh, instructor would come uh, every Friday evening. We'd do that for a while. And oh, you know, I was, I'd do that meditation as well. It, it's yeah. so fascinating for me to hear the skeptical scientist. I in, was so skeptical. All is, my, is now all rocking my out Kundalini yoga. You know, it's brilliant. <laughs> 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 yeah i'm more into running i'm more of a runner but um yes um i think it's fantastic and i think th there are tools that may not work for everyone but i, I think if there are so many different options and so many different forms it's like exercise yeah there's something that will work for you it's just a matter of finding out what you enjoy what you can do consistently over time because if you do it for three days, it's not the same as really having a regular practice. And I think a lot of people have a hard time putting in the effort with regularity. Yeah. But the beauty about this meditation is that it's literally only 11 minutes, 12, 12 minutes. And there's right loads on YouTube. Minutes. If people want to follow it, you can just yes. look it up on YouTube and follow yes. one along if people want to try Start it. Time. I mean, Lisa, look, we've not even gotten to your eight pillars yet and I have about 10 minutes left. So I, I know my audience are going to love this, Lisa. We'll see what we can get through and I might be able to persuade you for a part two at some point uh, because Great. I really think people will enjoy this. But Great. the things I thought We'll get through more if we can, but I found the, the stuff on phytoestrogens and soy yes. really interesting. And I don't think people on my show have heard much about that before. So yeah. I wonder if you could expand a little bit on those. Yes. So um, we were talking about hormonal replacement therapy, and which makes total sense, right? So as a woman, you're losing some of your estrogens, and the idea is to replace them with estrogens that come from the outside. Now, the source of the estrogen is something that a lot of scientists are looking into because where are these hormones coming from, right? In the very early formulations of estrogen replacement therapy, and still in some formulations today, the hormones were coming from the urine of pregnant horses, which is not attractive perhaps in some ways, but it's a very reasonable source. They have to come from something, right? So they can come from animals or they can come from plants. And something that I find very beautiful is that estrogen or estradiol is arguably the most ancient of hormones, which means that it's shared across all living beings, plants, animals, humans, as we also are animals, but we tend to forget about. So what that means is that plants make estrogens. They're called phytoestrogens from Greek, estrogens from plants. And they are so bioactive and so easy to share across species that the estrogens made by a flower or a plant really works the same way as the estrogens made in our own body. They're just milder. The effects are milder. They're more gentle. So sometimes people wonder, and some people are looking into this right now, myself included, if a diet that includes a lot of phytoestrogens from safe sources could be a gentle replacement to hormonal therapy. And the answers from culture, probably, seems to be probably yes. So where are these phytoestrogens coming from? The most abundant source is soy. And soy is very controversial. Yeah. But like we were talking about before, women in Asia do not suffer the kind of hot flashes and night sweats and neurological symptoms of menopause the same way that women do here in industrialized countries. It is possible that there's a genetic component. It is possible that the high quantity of isoflavones from the soy in their diet could also make a difference. Isoflavones are a very strong source of phytoestrogens. Yeah. Now, soy here is different, it's polluted, it's GMO, you know, genetically modified, is more, uh, is more of an allergenic for us than for Asian populations. So that may not be the best way to think about phytoestrogens, but there are a ton of other foods that contain a different kind of phytoestrogens. They're called lignans, 
And those foods are perfectly safe. And they're found very often in the Mediterranean regions. And we know the women on a Mediterranean diet have a much lower risk of heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, depression, anxiety, breast cancer, and dementia than women on like a Western type diet. So there's something about this diet that seems to be quite protective and quite supportive of women's health. And the key nutrients are sesame seeds, great source of phytoestrogens, uh, flax seeds, also a great source, dried apricots, believe it or not, for some reason, all sorts of legumes, especially chickpeas and beans, some fruits, especially strawberries, melon, cantaloupe, all these fruits and vegetables are really rich in phytoestrogens, and they have a whole list because I'm a scientist, so I have a whole table in the book with all different sources by group and their bioactivity. So I think for me personally, that's the way I eat, and I've done so much research using brain scans where we show quite clearly that if you're like a 50-year-old woman, your brain looks at least five years younger if you are on a Mediterranean diet. I'm going to say this again. If you're a 50-year-old woman on a Mediterranean diet, your brain looks at least five years younger as compared to a woman who's also 50 years old but who's been on a Western diet for most of his life. I mean, you can see them. You can see the brain scans. You can see the way the brain doesn't change when you follow a Mediterranean style diet and the way your brain literally shrinks at age 50 when, when you are on a Western style diet. And do we know, obviously you mentioned one component, some of those foods there are obviously very prevalent in Mediterranean style diets. The term Mediterranean style diet gets misinterpreted quite a lot and lots of people right. use it to, to make the, yeah, to make the case <laughs> for different kinds of foods. And so... I wonder, and I appreciate you've written a whole book, Brain Food, on different foods for your brain, which, which is well worth reading and said lots of practical advice in that and lots of specific foods. But, you know, is there some general broad principles of w what you're talking about when you say the Mediterranean diet? Yes. And I think, again, it's important to say Mediterranean style diet because otherwise it becomes really impractical even for me i can't find the same foods here yeah. that i used to eat in italy growing up but the point is plant-centric so vegetables and fruit and grains and legumes are really the focus of the diet when we use condiments they're more like unrefined vegetable oils like extra virgin olive oil flax oil flax oil is incredible for vegans I know there are so many vegans in England and a lot of your followers are vegan as well. I, I'm on and off vegan forever. Uh, flax oil is the oil with the highest concentration of polyunsaturated fatty acids, even more than extra virgin olive oil. And one concern about veganism is that unless you take supplements, your omega-3s could be quite low because especially the kind of omega-3s that are so important for brain health. So the DHA, because plants contain AHA that the brain needs to convert into DHA and up to 70% is lost yeah. in the conversion. So just one tablespoon of flax oil is pretty much more than half of all the omega-3s that you need for the day. Wow. So just a tip, because I was very excited when I found out I did a lot of research on that. But that's <laughs> but a great practical like, tip for people. Yes. It's a super great practical. That's something people can do right now. If they, you know, they, after this podcast, they can actually order something and actually start bringing it into their diet every day, right? Yes, it's very yellow. It tastes really nice. It's great with salads. So why not? Fantastic. It's a good tip. Yeah. Also, fish is a big part of the Mediterranean diet, whereas meat and dairy products are considered more like a treat, like an, oc an occasional treat. It's a very flexible diet. It's a very reasonable yeah. diet. It's not, you know, it's, it's not in any way suggesting deprivation or food restriction, which I find very sensible as a scientist. We always talk about diversity in the diet as being real key to health. Why are social networks so important? 
Well, uh, there's, I have a lot to say about this, but I'll um, try to say less. Um, what you and I are doing right now, Rangan, is the most complicated thing for the brain that we know of, having a conversation with somebody you don't know. It activates more regions of the brain than anything else that we know of. Um, it's, it requires turn-taking. Uh, we can't be both talking at once. Uh, it requires uh, empathy and compassion. I have to read your body language. So if you say to me, that's interesting, and you're looking right in the eye, that's different than if you say that's interesting and you roll your eyes on the top of your head. I've got to be keeping track of all these signals. Um, it, talking to somebody on the phone or through texting or through social networking is not the same. Actually talking to somebody is very, very important. Um, and, you know, we talk about changing your life, in a, becoming more resilient or more of anything that you want. Many of us don't need psychotherapy or meditation or drugs. We need it uh, simply to have friends and family who are spurring us on. And, uh, you know, my wife will say to me every once in a while, you haven't been to the gym in a couple of days. And I I don't feel like she's nagging me. We don't have that kind of relationship, but she's spurring me on, um, helping me to remember the things that I want to do. And I hope I do the same for her. Social support networks. The other thing is that um, one of the biggest killers in old age is loneliness, which is not the same as solitude because you can feel lonely in a crowded room and you can feel not lonely when you're by yourself. But loneliness uh, is a, the biggest predictor of, of fatalities. Yeah. And an interesting way to not get lonely is perhaps counterintuitive. It's to have what Barb Fredrickson from Stanford, uh, now at the University of uh, North Carolina, uh, she and her Stanford students together. Again, serendipity. I had this great education, and I learned about her work back then, she finds that micro-communications, just conversations with people on a bus or in the checkout line at the store, just a little 15-second, hi, how are you? How, how, how's the weather? I see you bought these uh, new cookies. Uh, I've never tried them. Do you like them? Having a few of these micro-conversations yeah. throughout the day is a real cure for loneliness, even for people who say, I could never do that. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And, and this whole thing about loneliness, I mean, you mentioned the elderly, it's, you know, the, the, if you look at the research in the UK, yes, the elderly, loneliness is a big problem. Men between the age of 30 and 45 in this country are one of the loneliest groups in society, which absolutely is uh, a big contributing factor to the growing tide of mental health problems in that age group and the growing rates of suicide. And I, I, I sort of can't help thinking about the digital world is in some way, for all its benefits, is contributing to this problem. And you mentioned that that digital communication is not the same as human connection. Do you know why that is? No, we don't know why it is, but it keeps showing up. Yeah, um, I th It may have to do with attention. Um, I, d I don't know of any work on the blind uh, or the deaf, which, is, uh, which would be helpful to have if, to sort this out. But... If you and I are in the same room, I can tell whether you're checking Facebook on the side yeah. or if you're texting somebody. Uh, and, you know, if we're just um, communicating digitally in some fashion, it's different. There's different requirements. Yeah. That nonverbal communication, I mean, I don't, depending on which stat you read, and you may know the, you know, some more current research than me, but it's something like 60, 70% of communication is nonverbal. Right. 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 So yeah. it's it's all that body language um, yeah. that obviously you can't pick up over a computer or over your phone. Um, and I love that thing about micro communication. It's something I've written about uh, quite a lot. And in my, in my latest book, which is all about five minute things that people can do, um, there's a section all on heart, what I call heart, which is not really about the physical structure of the heart. It's about human connection. Yes. And I, there's so many suggestions I make, but one of them is, look, if, you're, if, you, if you drink coffee every day and you go to a cafe and pick it up and you, you're in a rush and you get it in a takeaway, okay, if you have to get it in a takeaway, say something nice to the barista. You know, just say, hey, I really appreciate that. Or, or you know, hey, the latte you made me yesterday was amazing. I hope this one's as good today. Or whatever. It's amazing. When you strike up this little micro 
what, what did you call micro communications? Yeah, micro contacts, whatever. I've always liked doing things like that. And you know, if you if you work at like sometimes if I'm getting an early train to London, I'm up early. That's how I'm feeling a bit tired. And you you grab a drink on the way and you do that. You you. You feel different, right? It changed. You've had a bit, a bit of meaningful human interaction and it changes the way you feel. You don't feel quite as insular or stuck inside your heads. Right. In, in a big city um, like Manchester or London or any big city, um, generally our experience is we see all these people and we don't know any of them. Yeah. And we feel like we're on the outs. We're not part of the fabric of this community. Uh, and so just having a couple of quick conversations with somebody in the street, you now feel like you're an insider. You're, 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 yeah. you're part of the community. And people who know the names of their neighbors and chat with them a few times a week are happier than people who don't. Now, people always say, well, I could never do that. I'm too shy or I'm too nervous or people won't like me. or you know. Yeah. But what we find is that if they can get over that – could be through therapy or just willpower or inspiration or going out with a friend and letting the friend start the talking and then you ease yourself into it. Uh, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think once people get over that hump and start, it's actually a lot easier than you think. Yeah. You know, because we're, we're wired for that social connection that the other human you're interacting with also is highly likely to want and crave that human interaction as well. Because we're all walking around, you know, pretty lonely, certainly compared to how we used to be as a society. Of course, there's individual differences. And I think once you start, you find actually people want that. They, they really do. So I think that's another key takeaway for people. Social connections are important. I really want to talk to you about memory. And I think there's a certain societal narrative, which I know you're keen to challenge, about what happens as we get older. You know, is it true that our memory declines as we get older? Well, you know, I think that globally, the, the societal narrative is that after you're born, you begin acquiring skills and abilities. You know, when you're an infant, you begin to learn to talk. And then when you're a toddler, you begin to crawl and walk. And um, you learn to share when you're a young child. And, you know, it's, it's a matter, you go to university or a trade school and you pick up a bunch of skills. Uh, and the idea is that you keep adding and adding. And then at some point, you start to fall off a precipice. Maybe it's 50, 60, 70, but, you know, depending on your own um, story that you hold in your head, that aging is accompanied by inevitable decline. And that's not true. Uh, the, the brain does slow down. It can take longer to solve problems or retrieve a word. But there's no evidence that most of us will experience a real memory deficit. Now, of course, Memory deficit is a hallmark of Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's is rarer than we appreciate or realize. Um, you can go through your 80s and 90s with no, with no memory decrement, uh, apart from the fact that it might take you a little while longer to retrieve a memory. But if it was a memory impairment, you'd never get it. It would be lost. It just takes a little longer because of demyelination and other factors. So why is it then that so many of us think and take as fact that our memory declines as we get older? Well, I, I don't know. I think um, part of it is that the story was developed for the way we lived maybe 40 years ago. We're living longer and healthier than ever before. When my grandfather was 65 in 1966, he wasn't particularly healthy. Uh, right. A 65-year-old today is, in general, much healthier. Uh, he had been, um, he, everybody he knew, he was a doctor. They all smoked. Uh, I mean, in fact, you know, at least in the U.S., there were ads that doctors would recommend smoking, yeah. that they were good for your brain. You know, it's just it is so crazy to think of that now, isn't it? I mean, yeah. but that wasn't that long ago, really. No, it wasn't. Um, and I think that you know the way that older adults are portrayed in the, in movies and in jokes is that they're doddering and that they are losing their memories. It, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? In the sense that if that's what the movies are telling you and that's what media is telling you, and then let's say you're in your late 40s or early 50s and you forget something, you then will say to yourself, well, oh, that's because I'm getting older. And it almost is reinforcing that belief. And is that part of the problem? Like, rather than actually, I think there's an example you use either in the book or in an interview I've heard you say before that 
we just create a different narrative around it when we're older. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I teach college students and 19 year olds are uh, very forgetful. They lose their cell phones and their keys. They forget their computer passwords. This happens to 79 year olds too. Uh, but the story is different. When a 19 year old you know, has one of these memory lapses, lost my cell phone, can't find it. They just say, oh, I, I've got to get more sleep or uh, I've got too much on my plate. The 79-year-old or even 59-year-old says, it's Alzheimer's, I know it, Thing, it's, it's downhill from here. Part of the problem is that um, if you forget something and you obsess about it or stress about it, that's going to release cortisol and adrenaline, which are going to shut your memory down and they make it even worse. So if you're trying to find a word and you're just beating yourself up and say, oh, I, I have it here, it's, you know, uh, that's the worst thing you can do. It's better to let go. Now, we, we do know that when older adults have this memory lapse or delay in getting a word or a name. It's not actually the concept that they've forgotten. It's what's called the, um, the phonological word form, that peculiar set of vowels and consonants that represent the word. That's what you lose. And there's a very particular area of the brain that um, is a little bit decremented as we get older. So um, you might know that you're thinking of a flower and you can picture it and you know its use, but you can't get the name gladiola. But sooner or later, you'll get it. It's that, and you might even know it starts with G. It's uh, four syllables. I mean, we've had this tip of the tongue kind of a phenomenon, uh, but the uh, the proof that it's not really a memory deficit per se is that you get it eventually and and you know just don't stress out about it let it let it go i mean can we train that to be better let's say we we're thinking of that flower we can't think of gladiola is there something we can do to make it more likely that we can think of the word uh, we don't know uh, other than just letting go uh, yeah. and and moving on it's not that most of the time it's not that important that you get exactly the yeah. right word and I think that's important, isn't it? That whole idea that, that really circles back to something you said right at the start of this conversation about, um, you know, as long as you, I think you said something about diet. You don't, don't stress about it too much. And you're saying now when you stress about it and you release cortisol, cortisol in itself, when, you know, too much of it for too long a period of time will be detrimental to your memory. So chronic stress is detrimental to your brain, right? Absolutely. It's, 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 an, I mean, we've been listing big killers. Chronic stress, uh, is, is a huge killer. Uh, yeah. The, the fact is, though, you do need a little bit of stress. Yeah. Um, stress is actually neuroprotective and it kickstarts the immune system. Um, the, this is why I say, you know, if you if you retire from something, you should retire to something else. You need the modicum of stress that requires you to get up out of bed in the morning and groom yourself and go be with other people and make some work product that's got a deadline. All these things are important as long as they're not stressing you out completely. Uh, without that small amount of stress, we often see a, a great decline in mental and physical health. But yes, chronic, it's like with everything in the body. There's this Goldilocks zone. Yeah. You, you know, too little is no good. Too much is no good. You've got to come right, just yeah. right in the middle. You know, what? I, I teach um, a course that I created with, with uh, some colleagues of mine called Prescribing Lifestyle Medicine, accredited course that we teach to, you know, GPs and specialists and other healthcare professionals about the science of various lifestyle factors and how we can use them to help our patients. And I, I show this graph, uh, I think it's from a 2015 journal. I can't remember the name, the learning memory. I, I can't remember the name of the journal. But again, well, there is a, a journal of learning and memory. I think it's it, one of I our think, big journals. I think it's that one. And there's this beautiful graph showing stress's impact on the brain. And how, again, it's that, you know, you start off, as stress increases, your brain function is improved, um, but then you start to get diminishing returns, and then it, it starts to become detrimental. And we know that you know chronic stress, you know, kills nerve cells in the hippocampus and memory center of the brain. So, as you say, it is that Goldilocks zone. You need enough to get you engaged in life, but not so much that you're worrying about every little thing. I think you 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 actually mentioned in the book, don't you? People who 
ruminate a lot. They go over and over things and worry and, and um, become anxious about it. You're saying that actually makes your body awash with those stress hormones that can actually be detrimental to aging well. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, super, super interesting. And, like to- and, and the, um, the stress hormones not only uh, damage cells in the hippocampus, they damage your microbiota in the gut. They get it out of balance, and you know your microbiome is is creating ninety five percent of the serotonin that ends up in your brain, and doing all other kinds of things in terms of immune function. Yeah, I mean it's incredible. Um, I mean, Dan, there is so much that we could talk about. Going back to before before we close it off um, with some really practical tips for people. Um, you know, one thing I, I really was absorbed with in your book was that was the stuff on pain. And I think you quote a statistic saying that pain is the source of 80% of doctor visits in the US or something yeah. like that, which, yeah. which was really staggering. And it's interesting also that the way we treat pain today is basically the same way we've treated it for 2000 years with the bark of a tree, aspirin, or its, its synthetic equivalents, or the seed of a poppy. Opiates yeah. and their synthetic equivalents. We we have not made advances in two thousand years. Well, I wonder if that's because we're looking at it maybe through the wrong lens. And what I mean by that is, um, you say in your book that pain and that, I mean, why this is so important is we're talking about health span versus lifespan. Sure, you can live to a hundred, but if your last ten years are in chronic pain. You know, that is going to influence the quality of your life and how much enjoyment you get and what you're going to get out of that life. And you say that pain is influenced by cultural, environmental, historical, and cognitive factors. Isn't that interesting? So in the US, doctors all know, especially ER doctors, uh, emergency room doctors, uh, you call them something else here, I think. Yeah, well, A&E or emergency departments. All of them know that if you're a member of a certain cultural or uh, ethnic group, on the standard pain scale of one to 10, if you say that your pain is three, and you remember this particular group, they prepare the operating table. These are people who uh, are not um, accustomed to expressing pain. You know, zero is no pain, 10 is a lot of pain. If they say three, it's time to prep the operating room. There are other people who they'll say they have a nine and it means you can, you know, just let them sit in the waiting room for a few hours. There are these different ways we have of being in the world that are cultural. And and, and I guess in many levels, pain... Well, not many levels. Pain is subjective, right? So oh, it's absolutely that. Yeah. So, so therefore, if we're using a subjective scale, naught to ten, to tell the doctor in front of us or the healthcare professional how much pain we're in, of course, my three may be different from your three. Well, absolutely, and you know, and and it, it's it's a matter of uh, context. So if I'm hiking and I've got a rock in my shoe and it keeps pressing on this part of my foot, I'm really annoyed, and I'll I'll stop and take the rock out. Uh, but I might pay forty quid to go to a massage therapist to press on exactly that part of my foot. And give you the same level of pain. So it could be, let's say, a seven with a rock. It could be a seven with a with a with a vigorous and strong massage. But you you will interpret that differently, won't you? Oh, this is good for me because there's tension here that the massage therapist is releasing, as opposed to oh, something's there. And I guess in a nutshell, we could do two hours on just pain alone. It's it's that complex because there is. It's very clear now, isn't it? It's it's not just. It's certainly not just mechanical at all. There are emotional uh, stress, psychosocial components to do with pain, which makes it very challenging to treat um, for some people. But it's interesting, quite a lot of my talks, um, both for doctors and the public, I've had chronic pain consultants come along and I've often had chats with them afterwards. And they've said to me, you know, Ronga, we really like um, a lot of your work and a lot of the books because we can use these tools with our patients with chronic pain, because ultimately we realize that the medications, often they don't work. Um, we Sometimes they do, of course, as well, but it's really fascinating, this whole idea of pain. Um, you know, how come you wrote a chapter on pain? Well, um, again, I think part of it was that um, a lot of what we know about pain hasn't trickled down to the average person. A lot yeah. of it came out of McGill, where I uh, ran a lab for 20 years, yeah. from Ron Melzack. And in fact, I include the Melzack pain scale in the book, because if people can 
refer to it before they go to see their doctor or go to the A&E. Um, they're using the terms that doctors might be expecting them to use. Uh, for example, is the pain stabbing or is it dull? Is it yeah. uh, focused or is it, um, is it based on pressure or based on uh, laceration? These kinds of things. But the other reason I wrote about it is that, again, part of this societal narrative is that as we age, we're going to be miserable and in pain. And actually, the available evidence is that, yes, we do get aches and pains, and they get worse and worse, and then they start getting better. There's a point of inflection. It depends on the person, but around 75 or 80, our, our, the aches and pains somehow disappear for many of us or become manageable. Yeah, and that's, that's a very optimistic note. Um, which is a, it's a great way to start ending this conversation that I've really, really enjoyed. And I wish we did have another two hours. Me too. Um, you mentioned, I think, another another very exciting statistic is that 82 is the happiest age statistically. That's what I read in your book. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, so that gives us, for anyone who's listening to this podcast or watching on YouTube right now, who is under the age of 82, which is Probably many, if the majority certainly, I, I would guess. Um, that's pretty exciting. It means our, our happiest days are still to come, right? And I think we can push that out another 10 or 20 years if we can get rid of ageism and treat older adults with more dignity and respect, not allow them to fall into complacency and learned helplessness. I think yeah. 82 is, is movable. Yeah, well, I love that, Dan. I absolutely love that. And... Um, you know, I always like to close off the conversations with tips for people. So um, the podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of life. And I think the tips that you are, you know, the habits you're talking to people about in your book, yes, it's going to help them age better, but it's also going to help them feel better today. Yeah. Agreed. And that's what's really exciting. So I wonder, you know, you've done a lot of talks. You've been on a book tour for over two months now. Um, from everything that you have put into this book, from all the feedback you've had at events, you know, what are some of your top four or five tips that people can think about applying into their everyday lives immediately to improve the way that they feel? Well, follow healthy practices, uh, a moderate diet. There's no one diet that's been clearly shown superior to the others. The Mediterranean diet, the keto, the paleo, none of them have panned out, you know, statistically or research-wise. And, and actually, as you say, and we didn't get a chance to cover this, but you say, as I absolutely agree with, that often it's more important what you don't eat than what you do eat. Right. Uh, don't eat heavily processed foods. And it's also more important than we realized when you eat. Yeah. Uh, your metabolism is linked to your biological clock, that funnily named suprachiasmatic nucleus. And if you eat at the same time every day, you're going to digest the food and draw the nutrients out of it more completely. Yeah. Um, so moderated lifestyle in terms of diet, eat more plants than you usually do probably, but a varied diet uh, and um, get a good night's sleep um, and movement, which I see as the imprisoned corollary of exercise. It's not about whether you get an extra 20 minutes on the treadmill. It's about whether you actually get outside and move your whole body, yeah. uh, especially in nature. So that's three things. Uh, the healthy practices of diet, exercise, and sleep. Yeah. And then I would uh, talk about mindset, yeah. trying to cultivate curiosity, openness to new experience, conscientiousness, and resilience. And then the final thing, number five, is to associate with new people, especially younger people as you get older. Keep your social networks, and I don't mean your digital ones, I mean your in-person ones, going, because that is really an important part of uh, brain health and brain happiness. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this conversation, there's loads more like it on my channel. Please do press subscribe and hit that bell. Now, back to the conversation. How important is walking for our mood, for our happiness, and for our overall mental health. Yeah, so the, the, there are two different ways of looking at this. So uh, let's look at it kind of on the positive side first. Um, if you ask people to rate before they go for a walk how, how they're feeling now, 
uh, on a scale of one to five, they might say, I'm feeling it around about a two. And if you ask them to rate how they'll feel after they've gone for a walk, they'll say, meh, probably about a two. Then you bring them out for a walk for 20 minutes and you ask them to rate how they feel. They'll now say a four. Uh, so we persistently underestimate how good a walk will make us feel. Um, and that's true even for people who dread walking, who dislike walking. Um, they uh, underestimate just how much uh, are the positive effect of a walking uh, in kind of raising your, your mood uh, at the moment. Now, a, for a, a much more difficult uh, population or, uh, or a, more, a more difficult problem, uh, which is really a blight in, in modern life, major depressive disorder, um, the, the, the lifetime risk for uh, males and females combined is about 10%, uh, which is astonishingly high, way, way, way too high. Um, and a recent remarkable study in Australia uh, following, I think, about 35,000 adults uh, looked at the risk of succumbing to major depressive disorder uh, as a function of the amount of walking that the adults were doing. And for every level of walking a Above the most sedentary in the population, the risk of fall, or succumbing uh, to depression falls. So the, the lesson there is that you're less likely, if you do not have a have major depressive disorder, you're much less likely to succumb to it if you are walking more. It's a simple prescription that kind of acts to uh, inoculate you against the, the, the likelihood of, of succumbing to depression. Uh, what we don't know is whether or not walking uh, is a good and a, uh, effective treatment for people who are already depressed. Um, there are no good studies that I've been able to find in, in the literature where this is concerned. Um, I have a, a sense though that uh, when you look at the effect of very long-term walking, now I mean weeks uh, in nature, what you see from the, the kind of deep case studies that have been done, uh, people's, um, the, a whole series of inf inflammatory factors in the blood, the interleukins and a bunch of other things, they all fall and fall yeah. really dramatically. Um, and after it, walking. After walking substantial periods, you know, so for four or five or six weeks. I mean, uh, I think on that point, I think just to really amplify it, we've, we've spoken many times on this podcast before how chronic unresolved inflammation is at the heart, is at the root cause of so many of the chronic problems that exactly. we see today, whether yeah. it's... Uh, many cases of depression, whether it's type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, um, obesity is an, a, is an inflammatory disease on, on so many levels. And yep. what you've just said is that prolonged periods of walking can have an anti-inflammatory effect, effect on the Absolutely. body. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question about this. Uh, the, the problem is uh, few people have the capacity or, or uh, the means to, to undertake a six-week walk uh, in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, there's an ethical issue, of course, if you've got somebody who's who's succumbed to major depressive disorder, they need treatment and they need treatment now. Um, organizing a nature walk for them and uh, yeah. doing this over a six week period is, is it would be a, a very, very difficult thing indeed to do. But um, I think that the kind of the more causal issue uh, still is there. We, we see in those people who do these very long periods of walking, all these inflammatory factors fall in their blood. Uh, and Ed Bulmore and others um, have uh, posited the kind of theory that uh, one of the key drivers of depression is inflammation in the brain. Yeah. And his recent book, The Inflamed Brain, yeah. actually argues that this is the case. And, and you see, and we've been doing studies on this in humans uh, and others, uh, 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 or sorry, humans who are treated with uh, Drugs like interferon alpha for uh, uh, cancer and other things become very, and hepatitis C, they, they become, are often become very uh, acutely depressed as the result of the treatment with inter interferon alpha, which is a, a pro inflammatory uh, cytokine. Yeah. So there may well be, uh, you know, at least one sub class of major depressive disorder, which is inflammatory uh, or inflammation related. Yeah, I interviewed ads. Um I don't know, six, nine months ago or so on this podcast, we had a great conversation. People really responded very warmly to to our chat. And um, 
I think mechanistically, we can now start to put these things together and understand, yes, we want more data. Of course, we always want more and more robust research. But I think mechanistically, there's enough there to to be suggesting that, you know, well, walking potentially could be used as, yeah. you know, an adjunct at least. Yeah. You have spoken about two hunter-gatherer groups in the book, which I find super fascinating because I always think when we can go back into our evolutionary history, observe how humans have lived, how they've evolved, how we've evolved, how we've thrived in, in a variety of different environments. It helps to put into perspective many of the problems we're having today. I have written about the Hadza tribe, um, but more specifically in relation to their diet and in terms of the amount of fiber they're getting and the impact it's having on their gut microbiome. But you shared some insights on the Hadza tribe and another tribe as well, actually, that I found very surprising. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so the the other tribe are the Simani in uh, South America. Um, and the average 80-year-old Simani has uh, the coronary artery health of a 50-year-old American. Uh, because uh, they spend so much time uh, out and about and moving. Um, and uh, what's, what's remarkable is, uh, you know, when you look at the, the kind of diets that they have, they certainly have meat in their diet. There's no question about that. But they have almost no processed food or basically they have zero processed food. They have a very high fiber diet. Um, they forage for nuts and berries uh, and uh, the, the sweeteners they use are typically either crushed fruits or uh, uh, honey um, and uh, their calorie intake is typically lower than uh, the calorie intake of a, of a Westerner. Um, it, it's not that they're burning more energy. In fact, actually, when you look at the the amount of energy burned by uh, a Hadza or a Tsimani, it's it's more or less the same as a, a Westerner. And uh, we that, have that's, the, that's really interesting that. Just say that again because I think that will surprise people. Yeah, and I was just going to elaborate on it. So the, the amount of energy they burn is approximately the same as a, as, a, as a Westerner. And the reason for this is that we overestimate the effects physical exercise have on energy burn uh, and, our, and our, on our metabolism during the, the course of the day. So here's an easy way to think about it. Uh, the, the, the kind of recommendation for males is that they consume 2,500 calories per day. So let's call that 2,400 for the sake of, of uh, easy maths. Ease maths. Uh, so that's 100 calories uh, in a, per hour for a 24-hour cycle. That 100 calories has to uh, take care of your breathing, uh, your heart is beating 60, 70 times uh, a minute or whatever it happens to be. Um, your brain burns an astonishing amount of energy. 20% of the, the cardiac output of the heart goes to the brain uh, and the brain needs energy being pushed into it all the time. The liver burns an enormous amount of energy. Um, and the energy that we use for running and all of these other functions turns out to be a very limited amount of the energy that we burn during the course of the day because housekeeping in our body uh, absorbs so much of it. So what happens in, in these uh, other groups is they just eat less uh, and the calories that they eat to, or the, 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 the sources of calories come from foods where the available calories require extra work by the body. So if you're eating calories that are bound up in fiber, uh, your body has to work to extract those calories. Whereas, you know, you get a cheesecake, you get the hit from the cheesecake within yeah. <laughs> a couple of minutes. Uh, so the highly processed foods that we're consuming really are a, a, a major problem. Um, what we really need to do is, is to try and shift away from the, the, the very highly processed foods uh, in favor of foods that are, are uh, where the calories are a little bit less accessible, where we have to work a little bit harder. Um, and I, I, I describe it in the book. That ironically, there's a diet that's used in lab animals uh, and its nickname is the Western diet. <laughs> uh, and the Western diet is amazing. Um, it's a, a, a diet that consists of a, a fat and sugar kind of uh uh, Combo, mixture, yeah, com uh, and rats go nuts for it. Um, they will eat it until they are bloated. Um, and humans love this stuff as well. We call it ice cream. Uh, <laughs> we call it uh, cheesecake. Uh, we, we call it chocolate. Uh, um, if you have, we don't eat spoons of sugar. Uh, it'd be quite a disgusting thing to do. Uh, we don't eat spoons of fat. But if you mix fat and sugar together in the right proportions and you emulsify them just right, they become highly palatable sources yeah. of direct energy that we can eat really, really easily. Uh, and this is actually the problem. So sugar tax, to my mind, you know, 
might modify behavior a bit. It might take down the the, the, the amount of sugar in a in a, a fizzy drink, but actually the issue is is to do with something much more subtle to do with the the fat sugar ratios that we're we're consuming. Yeah, and uh, as I said many times before, that the the thing that is consistent with many populations around the world who seem to have really good health outcomes when we look at their diets is that they're having minimally processed foods. Yeah. That seems to be more consistent than whether we're looking at the fat content or the carb content or you know other any other sort of reductionist type approach we might take. Generally speaking, they're minimally processed. And I guess that really fits in with what you're saying is that there's a bit of effort that we have to use in our bodies to actually extract the energy from them in which yeah. we're trying to so do. Think, think about the smoothie. Don't eat the smoothie or drink the smoothie. Eat the fruit yeah. <laughs> that goes into the smoothie. It's better for you. And your body has to work a bit harder to get the calories out of it. Yeah, for sure. Just going back to energy expenditure in these hunter-gatherer tribes, um, are you saying that actually when we walk or when we run, we're not burning as many calories as we think we might be? Absolutely, yeah. I... So, so this whole idea that, oh, you know, I went to the gym after work, so I can now chill out on the sofa and actually treat myself with, you know, A, B or C. It's even worse than that because <laughs> uh, uh, you've gone to the gym, your body thinks, hmm, I've persistence hunted. I deserve a reward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you, you've done your hour of running and you've run down the antelope and there's the meat <laughs> so uh, actually your body is saying to you after exercise uh, we're going to have a period of inactivity now so uh, you, you have this phenomenon known as exercise induced inactivity and during that period of inactivity especially in the evening um, we're much more likely to eat and we're also likely to feel hungry because of course uh, uh, the hunger hormone uh, ghrelin is uh, uh, increased in our in our blood uh, in the evening before we go. So this is another reason why we should go to bed on time is uh, as we stay up, this hormone is there and it makes us want to eat. Um, but we, we do have this exercise-induced inactivity phenomenon. So to, to expand that even further, in some cases, I need to be careful how I word this, but in some cases, could it be that going for your run after work or going for your intense gym session after work may potentially be counterproductive if it then leads to you um, feeling that you've expended more energy than you had. It leads to you feeling more hungry and eating more than you otherwise would have done. Could, could in some cases... That can happen. And yeah, you, yeah, you have a psychological license effect. Uh, so what you really have to do is look at the total energy expenditure across the day. You know, So if you're engaging in very little activity, you're sitting down all day, you do this big spike of activity, and then you're back again, um, of course you're going to... Uh, eat more. Whereas if you're engaging in high levels of activity during the course of the day, distribute, excuse me, distributed across the day, that would be better for you because that's what we're designed to do. We're designed to mooch about more or less every hour yeah. <laughs> during and, the course and, of and the day. That echoes many studies we're seeing now, which are suggesting at least that you really can't outdo the the negatives of sitting down all day simply by going to the gym for one hour yeah, after no, work. No, it doesn't work. It, it, yeah. it just simply doesn't work. And like again, I'm, yeah. just to be super clear, I'm not telling people, and I don't think you are either, not to go to the no, gym after no, work. We're not no. saying that. We're saying, look at the total energy expenditure yeah. across your day and the total pattern of activity across your day. Uh, the gym can be a very important part of that. But if you're sitting down all day, and then going to the gym for an hour, don't expect it to be a magic cure. Yeah. Shane, do we sometimes think that walking is a little bit too easy? It's a little bit too simple. Like we're looking for those, um, you know, we get more excited when we hear about the latest new gym fad that's come out, you know, the, the, I don't know, the boxer size or the cross the trainer cro the or cross the cross trainer or whatever. Yeah, and I, and yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not absolutely, you know, I'm not trying to say that those things don't have value. I'm just saying, have we missed what is sitting right in front of us by looking for more exciting forms of movement and physical activity? Is it is it sitting right there in front of us? And have we, I don't know, is it is it reflective of culture and where we're at that we're always looking for the new gimmick, the new thing that's going to somehow, you know, reverse our, our, our biological age and get us fitter and healthier, whereas walking probably does all of the above 
and more. Yeah, well, humans are novelty seekers. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. And we are status seekers. Of course, you know, people buy cool pieces of gym kit so they can look down on the people who don't have them. Um, but, you know, we, we, we can leverage this in other ways. You know, one of the or some of the best experiences you can ever have of walking are when you're walking with another person. Um, yeah. You know, so it is something that's very easy for us to do. It's in front of us. Um, but, you know, have a walking group, have a text group, uh, have a WhatsApp group or whatever it happens to be and we can get the benefits of it very easily and you know it's something that I think you know it should be engineered invisibly into our lives it's 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 not yeah. you know it should just simply be the default that we have it as something that we don't have to think about um, yeah. but it happens naturally all the day or all during the course of the day every day yeah for sure I was struck by something I heard you say once um, and that was that We've been trying to get robots to be able to walk for a long period of time, but but we just we just can't, or we find it very very difficult. And I think that really made me think. You know, is walking, is putting one foot in front of the other, as simple as we think it is, or is it, or is it actually deceptively complex in in such a way that actually we can't train robots to do it? Yeah, it, it is horribly complex. Uh, so it's easy to put a robot on wheels, and it can get around very very well on wheels. Um, but to get a robot to to walk with the facility and ease that humans can, that has been a really, really difficult thing uh, for uh, roboticists to engineer. And again, we we all kind of overlook the long period of training that we engaged in when we made that transition from being crawlers to walkers. It took about a year. Uh, we had to do 15 or 16,000 steps a day across all sorts of terrain. We fell 50, 70 times a day um, and uh, we had to develop range and movement. We had to learn how to uh, get balance. We had to learn how to carry the dolly to mommy when our daddy or whatever it happened to be when we were moving around. We had to learn that certain areas of the kitchen yeah. were dangerous. You know, th there were all those kinds of things that, that happen during that uh, early phase and robots don't get that training phase, you know. So it, it may well be the case that a, in future years, roboticists will just say, look, we just we can defeat the problem if we can have robots that learn and that's fine uh, or it's just easier to build things that have wheels or track yeah. uh, and I suspect you know that's the route that, yeah. that they will probably go down because uh, that's re they're easy to control in a way that uh, uh, learning to walk isn't It seems that at its core what we have here is that walking has got a PR problem um, your book clearly in praise of walking is trying to solve that problem and give it more PR but I guess if if we look at it as a PR problem, Shane, and we think about why, how we can make walking more attractive to people. If you were head of a advertising company and you had two minutes to actually, <laughs> um, you know, talk about why all of us should walk more than we do, what would you say? I oh, I would say you'll feel better, you'll look better, you'll think better. <laughs> All of those things will happen. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think it's a problem for PR. Uh, I, I, I really think it's a problem for the invisible system that's yeah. around us. Why are our footpaths so narrow? Why do we give so much space uh, to cars? Uh, why do we make it so difficult for elderly people to cross the road? Because uh, we've engineered the, uh, the, 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 the crossing uh, time to be slower uh, or to be faster than they can they can walk. It's all of those kinds of problems. Yeah. I, I, I think walking will happen naturally and easily if we facilitate it and it doesn't when we don't. I, 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 I do think we should all be walking more but I, I think we individually run into a collective action problem yeah. which is that we need our society, our urban world to be designed better for uh, us. And this is a common theme that I think keeps coming up in the social commentary around health. It keeps coming up on this podcast. I had Chris Boardman, the Olympic cyclist on this oh, yeah. podcast a little while ago. And again, he's very keen to try and raise the profile of cycling. And he's, again, trying to get these cities to make cycling easy. Easy, exactly. So that people, yeah. you know, and the whole helmet issue is a separate issue, but Chris almost makes a case, I think, that actually let's make it safe so that people don't feel they have to put on helmets every time they get on a bike. Let's just make it easy. Let's make it... 
um, not something that's a real pain for people to have to do every time they want to go and cycle to work. Just make it the easy thing. And, you know, you're saying a very similar thing with walking. Let's engineer our environment so that the behavior we want is easy. So the behavior we want is the default option. option. That, is what, exactly. that is what all these healthy societies around yeah. the world do. That's what all the blue zones have. They're not trying to be healthy. The environment is set up in such a way that health is the easy option. Um but it, the problem is a kind of a, a public health one, isn't it? Yeah. You know, public health isn't sexy, but public health has actually delivered the kind of great health gains of uh, over the, the, the past 100 or 200 years. We don't think about sewerage anymore. Uh, 200 years ago, you could not walk the city. We couldn't have walked the city in, in Dublin or whatever because people didn't have uh, public sewer. Or, you yeah. know, they, they had chamber pots and they threw whatever out the window. Um and there was disease rampant and the, all of the problems. So we, we've engineered that problem away. Um, and I think the challenge for architects, for town planners and others, is to do exactly the same thing. Take the public health issue seriously um, and engineer the way our cities and towns are designed so that people can actually walk easily around in them. Yeah, absolutely. Shane, in terms of your own behavior, I'm really intrigued. You've written this great book on walking. By writing that book, by going into the research, I think you already knew, but no doubt you you dove a little bit deeper when you were writing the book. Did writing it actually change your behavior in any way? Are you doing anything differently now than before you wrote the book? Uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> it's the honest truth. Um, I've always walked and walked lots. Um, uh, I think what's changed for me most in the recent years where walking is concerned is the presence of a pocket health pedometer in my phone. And I, I'm now very obsessive about checking the number of steps that I take every day. And, I, and I'm much more conscious, I think, of how uh, good I feel on days when I've had lots of walking. And when occasionally, as it does happen in life, you have a couple of days where just it's raining too much. There's too many things happening, and I've just haven't managed to get my yeah. fifteen thousand steps in. Um, how bad uh, I feel on well, not bad, but you know, just a slightly silted up. I feel on those yeah. days. Well, let's just briefly touch on technology here, because I think you brought up a very good point. So you track your daily steps, and um, you know whether we should be tracking our daily steps is something that people seem to have quite um, you know, quite powerful views about. Either way. And you made the case in the book that it's a good thing to track your daily steps. And one of the things I can see from hearing that story in terms of what you do is you're helping to almost tap into your own intuition. You're, you're seeing, hey, when I've done 15,000 steps, actually, I feel better. My mood's better. I'm sleeping better, whatever it might be. And when I don't hit the same amount, actually, I don't feel as good. So I guess that's one thing I think a lot about is can we use modern technology in a way to help tap into our own Intuition. It sounds like you're doing that. Yeah, use it to support uh, how you're functioning. You know, the the reality is, if I ask you, how many steps did you walk last Thursday fortnight? No you idea. No idea. How many steps did you walk yesterday? No idea. No idea. We are not designed to remember either the periods of time that we walk for or the number of steps that we take because our bodies and brains are too busy doing other things. Uh, so we do need to record them and it's easy to do. I cannot see a meaningful argument in the world uh, uh, that says that we shouldn't. And what we know is when we look at the self-report data, you know, what people say they do against what we know they've done because we've got the smartphone data, people under and overestimate really terribly yeah. how many walking steps they take every day, how, how fast they walk, where they've walked. People are awful at this. Um, and that's fine. Uh, our brains are not designed to remember this kind of stuff, but we've designed little pocket held robots to do it for yeah. us, so we should use them. I think the flip side is, and I guess blood pressure monitors are a great example of this. I think they work beautifully well for half my patients. The other half, they're actually problematic in the sense that if you're the kind of person who uses it once a week to see how you're getting on and it motivates you to make positive lifestyle choices, I think it's great. Some people, on the other hand, will check it three or four times a day. They'll really stress themselves out every time they see you know, a, a slight increase in the reading. And actually, for many of those patients, it starts to become counterproductive. Yeah. I don't necessarily think walking, um, tracking your walking steps 
is is the same. I don't either. I think I think you know this is a, a kind of a, a just a passive record of yeah uh, what you're doing over the course. I, of I the find day. If, and, yeah. with my patients, I found actually it's more positive motivating factor. Actually, it's like if they set a goal um, of let's say they want to do eight thousand steps a day, and if at the, uh, if by dinner time they've only done six thousand steps. Often it it's a motivator for them to go. Hey, you know what? After dinner, I'm just, just going to go, go and get for my... a quick twenty minute walk. Yeah, yeah, because they want to they want to meet that sort of <laughs> yeah. standard that they've set for themselves. The other thing I wanted to just briefly touch on at the end of this interview about uh, technology is you mentioned all the benefits of going out for long walks um, in terms of what it does for our brain and our minds. Now I'm conscious when I ask this question that many people are listening to this conversation right now whilst out walking or out running. But is there something to be said for going out and walking without headphones in your ear, without you know losing yourself in music or a podcast? Yeah, so I, I listen to podcasts when I walk. Sometimes I, uh, when I'm I'm walking, what I do is I listen to a podcast for the first half, and I stop listening to it for the second half. Um, so I, I I simply don't know. Uh, I, yeah. I, I I I think you know the uh, the best experiences I've ever had of walking have been walking with other people. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think if, if listening to the podcast gets you out for an hour that you would otherwise have spent sitting in a chair, go for it. I think it's great. Um, uh, if you're trying to problem solve, uh, if you're trying to think through a difficult problem, I think having the auditory distraction is a bad idea. Um, especially if you want to have a quiet conversation with yourself about something. Yeah. You know, you want to think through, why did I say that? Or, you know, you know, you're going to have a difficult problem to deal with tomorrow. How do you approach it? What are the, the ways you're going to uh, approach the person you have to talk to about it? I think in, in those cases, but I think we just need to be a little bit self-conscious about this. Um, yeah. And we also need to think our ears need to rest from time to time. So maybe, you know, keep yeah. the... Uh, the sound down a bit. Yeah, I love that. If you're trying to solve a problem, maybe, you know what, go out with nothing on. But if you're just going to sit at home and listen to a podcast and you have an hour, why not go out and walk whilst yeah, you're listening? Absolutely. Right? So yeah, I think it's yeah. beautiful because it's not like demonizing technology. Yeah, it's just no, sort no. of saying, hey, just think about what you're trying to achieve or, or what your current state of mind is and then do the appropriate behavior. Yeah. Shane, I've really, really enjoyed chatting to you. Um, I think you've written a brilliant book. This podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When people feel better in themselves, I think they get more out of life. I think this conversation in many ways is you're very, very strongly making the case that when we walk more, we live more. Yes, it's the environment. Yes, we'd love it if urban settings and cities and workplaces and schools could be set up in a way that makes it much easier for all of us to walk. Having said that, I wonder if on an individual level, you can provide some tips, some actionable tips that people listening to this podcast can think about applying into their own life immediately to improve the way that they feel. Yeah. So uh, always have a comfortable pair of shoes close. You know, if, if you're wearing high heel shoes to work, keep a pair of runners under the desk uh, so you can go out for a walk at lunchtime. Set your computer, if you're working at a computer, to have the alarm go off every 25 minutes, which I do, and get up and go for a walk around. Uh, if you find that you have to drive uh, your car to somewhere, park a, as far away as you reasonably can and walk that extra distance. If you're taking the train to work, as I do, get out two stops early and walk that last uh, remaining distance. Um, those kinds of things, just very, very simple changes. If you're going out to get lunch at lunchtime, don't go to the closest shop. You know, use Google to help you uh, do the restaurants near me or the shops near me and try and find somewhere new that's a little bit further away so that you just get in an extra 1,200 steps here, an extra 800 steps there, so that at the end of the day, somehow you've racked up 10 or 12 or 14,000 steps and you haven't thought about it at all. And what's really important and what my research has shown consistently, which I'm very happy about, is that our brains age differently. That we think about aging as something that is quite linear, and that is pretty much the case in men, which is great. It's a great thing. For women, it's more like a step ladder. There are some very important turning points that accelerate aging and slow down aging. Accelerate aging slow it down. And as scientists and as clinicians, we're just never told that this is the case. We're not told that we age differently and we're not told why that is the case. And one of the big 
answers that we have come up with is that our hormones are really key for brain aging, especially in women. Yeah. That is... There's a lot of information all at once. It it is, but I, I think what you have just said there, Lisa, is so profound and so important because actually if society is not aware of that, if Mm -hmm. scientists, if doctors are not aware of that, that we can start to put that bias into how we talk to people, how as a doctor, I treat my patients, you know, that, that, that bias can infiltrate. And actually, I guess there's a broader philosophical point for me, as I'm reading your book, and you sort of do cover this in your introduction, you know, actually what we're talking about on some level is a form of discrimination, really, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> clearly so. It starts with Darwin, you know, the father of evolution and all modern theories of biology. He, he was incredibly misogynist, and he would say that uh, women's brains are inherently inferior to men's brains. And this is pretty much the framework that scientists were operating under for centuries, just trying to prove that women's brains were not as good as men's brains. And that was really based on observations of size. So if you do compare a number of brains, male and female brains, female brains, women's brains are smaller, but that's because women are smaller than men on average. Right? Our head size is smaller, so it makes sense that our brains are also smaller. Once you account for head size, there's really not much difference in volume. What we do find is that there are very specific subtle differences in some parts of the brain that are also correlating with behavior, which I think is really nice when we say, for example, that um, we know that women have better verbal memory than men. This is related to some differences in the structural and functional cognitivity of the brain that is slightly different in women than in men. Can you explain verbal memory? Yes, verbal memory is their ability to remember verbal information. So if somebody tells you something, you as a woman remember it. (laughs) I'm laughing because we have this, you know, with with my husband, I literally had to repeat the same thing five times before he actually even pays attention to me. Um, well, he's a man, but, right? So his verbal, yeah, exactly. his verbal memory is inferior to yours as a woman. Yeah, it's not his fault, right? Um, but then it is true that men have better visual spatial abilities on average. Again, this is not an absolute, but better sense of direction, for example. And there's a lot of um, debate over whether that is the case or not, but it does seem to be to be true, and it is also reasonable if you think about evolution. Right, a long time ago, our ancestors um, used to go out hunting. The male, right, the men used to go out hunting and needed to be able to go back home, whereas the women would stay back and nurture the children and take care of the elderly. So it makes sense that those parts of the brain that are involved in direction finding would be more developed in men to some extent. And those parts of the brain that are more about nurturing and raising a family might be a little bit more, um, I'm not going to say developed because that's unkind to, to fathers who are incredibly wonderful, but they're just built a little bit differently in women. They're, they're wired a little bit differently. I would say wired is a good, Word. Our brains are somewhat wired differently. And that really starts from the moment of conception because our genes are different, right? Women are born with the XX genotype, which is also the title of my book, the XX brain. Men are born with an X and the Y chromosome. And it's really interesting that these chromosomes are quite different. Like the X chromosome is so much bigger then the Y chromosome. It's got 1,098 genes as compared to the 78 genes in the Y chromosome. So women are literally born with 1,000 genes more than men, which are important for reproduction, but also for brain function. So from the moment we're born, our DNA is telling our brains as women that our brains really respond to our reproductive organs in a very strong way. 
And that is really such an important underlying mechanism for our entire research on brain aging, because it's really the interaction between the brain and the reproductive organs that in many ways drive brain aging in women. Yeah. You said before that for women, as they age, there's often a stepwise change. You know, with men, it's more gradual. What, you know, are there key moments in life where these step changes start to happen? And if so, what are they? They are the, the three P's, puberty, pregnancy, perimenopause. So puberty is obviously common to both men and women. And it's really the beginning of our life as adults, right? So the brain, from the moment of conception, the brain has been growing, 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 growing at light speed. But once we hit puberty, there's a moment. That, these are called neuroendocrine transition states. And what the word means is that is a neurological system, our brain, and their endocrine systems that are in transition together. So something is changing. You're maturing from a sexual perspective, but so is your brain in ways that go above and beyond reproduction. So during puberty, there's this explosion of hormonal power that in a very interesting way leads to the brain losing volume. You would think the brain would explode as well. Instead, it's exactly the opposite. The brain says, okay, that's it enough growing, I need to specialize. And so a number of synapses, which are the connection between neurons, are just being discarded because the brain doesn't need them anymore. At that point, you know how to lace up your shoes, right? You know how to ride a bike. You don't need to remember all the, the, the different little steps. Those neurons can go, those connections can go. And the brain gets smaller, but more efficient. And those, those neurons that you have in your brain once you're an adolescent are pretty much all the neurons you'll have for the rest of your life. Your synapses will change, will grow, will get discarded, but your neurons pretty much are final. And then for men, things remain pretty stable over time. And I want to just clarify that these changes are mediated by our hormones. And we all know the hormones differ between men and women, right? Men have more androgens, like testosterone. Women have more estrogens, like estradiol, which is the most potent of our estrogens. And what's important is that these hormones are not just key for reproduction and fertility. They're also really incredibly important for brain function. They literally supercharge your brain. So when the levels of these hormones are high, your brain energy is also high. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's really profound because mm -hmm. we, you know, in common parlance, we, we often talk about our puberty and how people start, you know, obviously what it means for boys and girls when they go through puberty. Um, we, we know about these different stages in life, but we often think about them through the lens of hormones. And even, you know, the general public will talk about it as hormonal changes. Yeah. But we often don't make the link. Never. That, that hormones <laughs> that are changing in our body also have an impact on our brain. And, and so I think what you're doing with your work is really, you know, almost getting that conversation up on a par saying, yes, it's hormones. You, you know, it's hormones, but those hormones actually change the way your brain functions as yeah. well. Yes. Those are the same hormones and it's just not common knowledge. I find even with scientists, I, I studied neuroscience. I have a PhD in neuroscience and nuclear medicine. And no once did anyone mention hormones to me. Menopause. Yeah, you know, we know that that happens to women, but how and why nobody seems to care about, to really talk about. So it's interesting for me that I, I literally work at the intersection between neurology, neuroscience, and women's health. And it's a really strange space to work in. <laughs> there are many people who work in neuroscience and there are so many people who work in women's health, but they don't talk to each other. So if you go to a brain person like me, we understand the brain. We don't really understand the ovaries or reproductive systems. 
And then you go to an OBGYN or a women's health doctor and they don't fully understand how the brain works. Yeah. So I think it's so important to, to have this conversation and make sure that people are aware that the brain is not an isolated organ, but rather that they're, they're, there's a constant communication going on between our brains and the reproductive organs every day of our lives. So the health of the ovaries for women and the health of the reproductive organs for men and women is so crucial for brain health yeah. and the other way around. I mean, I think one of the, the reasons I've always been drawn to your work and really, really connected with it is because you very much do see the body as a system. Yes. You know, the, the, that's one thing that I really like. It's very, very aligned with how I look at the human body mm -hmm. as well. Right. But you also, as you write about in, in your latest book, you know, you don't believe in this sort of one size fits all approach, um, yeah. which again is completely aligned with, with how I think. Yeah. And I think a lot of the tips towards the end of the book, which are so practical, I think it really helps people try and identify what are the right approaches for them, what they can experiment with to see if it works for them. So yeah, I, I think it's a super, super interesting point. And I, I've got to be honest, I think it's one of my frustrations with, with medicine is, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot within the profession I'm proud of, mm -hmm. but actually I do think on some things we've got slightly off track and we've got very, very microscopic through one lens looking at a particular organ. Yes without seeing the big picture and your work highlights that so beautifully. Thank you. I used to be very vertical in my work, you know, just one topic and go really, really deep. And I, I find as you start going horizontal, it's so much more interesting and so much more satisfying to really think about you as a person not as a bunch of bits and pieces that magically work together. No, we are systems, like you said, and I think we, as a society, we have a tendency to think of our brains as not being part yeah. of the system, whereas I think it's so important to understand that everything that happens in your body has an effect on your brain as well. So by taking care of your body, you take care of your, of your brain and your cognition and your mood and your affect and your sleep and everything you need for life. Do you remember when exactly that changed for you? And, and the reason I ask that, Lisa, is because, you know, I always talk about the fact that I'm a clinician, okay? Mm. So I'm not a researcher. So I've spent, you know, nearly 20 years seeing patients. And so mm. I always listen carefully. I observe what's happening, who's getting better, who's not getting better, what's going on, why do people come in with three or four different symptoms? And if I can, let's say, help them change various aspects of their lifestyle, all three or four of them start to get better as well. And you think, okay, hold on a minute, what's going on here? So my perspective that everything's connected comes very much from what I've seen with patients. Mm -hmm. what, you know, a lot of scientists, by nature, the scientific method, I guess, has to be slightly reductionist at certain times. So what happened to you? Do you remember that exact moment when you started yeah. less vertically and started to move out horizontally? I do. I do. And it was, it was <laughs> in some ways, it was frustrating. So I was, I was studying Alzheimer's disease, again, trying to understand what causes Alzheimer's disease. And this is, this is particularly important because Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia on the planet affecting almost 6 million patients in the United States alone. And similar, um, a similar two to one ratio is found pretty much in all countries that we have data for, which means for every man suffering from Alzheimer's, there are two women, which is something we never talk about, right? So we know that women have a higher risk of breast cancer, for sure, and breast cancer gets the pink ribbon and everybody clearly understands breast cancer is a women's health issue. But a woman who is 60 years old is almost twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease in the rest of her life than she is to develop breast cancer. And nobody talks about Alzheimer's disease as something that women should be concerned about or should know about. And when I started working in this space, then we got so much pushback. Like the whole time, the whole time I was always, well, sweetheart, you know, <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> I always get that sweetheart, you know, the condescending. Yes, girl. But, um, 
women live longer than men and Alzheimer's disease is a disease of old age. So it's inevitable the more women than men develop Alzheimer's disease. And it took a really long time for me and for other scientists to really prove that that is just a bias. We're just not thinking about it correctly. Number one, women don't live that much longer than men. But most importantly, Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age. We tend to associate it with the elderly because the symptoms develop usually when people are like in their 70s. The average age at onset here in the United States is 71 years old. But in truth, Alzheimer's disease starts with negative changes in the brain years, if not decades, prior to the cognitive symptoms. It's a very insidious disease. It's a, it's a silent disease that starts in midlife and accumulates over time. And then eventually the damage is so severe that you get clinical symptoms. And so the question changed to, given that Alzheimer's disease is a disease of midlife or middle age, what happens in midlife only to women and not to men that could potentially explain why more women than men have Alzheimer's disease? And we just showed recently that what happens to women is that we tend to develop Alzheimer's plaques before men do, at an earlier age than men do, and specifically during the transition to menopause. And that created chaos when we showed that. That was like a, like, whoa. Because we never, ever talk about menopause is something that could be associated with Alzheimer's disease. We never talk about menopause as something that could potentially impact their brains, right? Let alone increase risk of Alzheimer's in women. So that was a big deal. And for me, I was not expecting that, to be honest. So that was my aha <laughs> moment. We have to shift gears here and just start completely from scratch. Yeah, I mean, Lisa, as you, as you sort of talk through that. It makes know, sense. I, it, it makes complete sense. Yes. And I have, I have a sort of whole different range of emotions mm. um, from anger to frustration to, you know, feeling this is very, very unfair. I, I guess I'm slightly clouded at the moment that my, my elderly mum's not going through a great time at the moment mm. uh, with she lives by herself. She's falling a little bit. My brother and I are helping right. out loads. We're trying to get things uh, back on track. But, but you know, occasionally I, I, I talk to my brother and go, hey, is mom, is mom still kind okay. of, you know, have you noticed something? And then a few days later, she's better again. So like, you know, it's, and I'm too close to it to be objective. But I guess the point I'm trying to get to is you think, This research, mm -hmm. if you wound it back and let's say it was done 50 years ago or 100 yeah. years ago, right? Yeah. How many women's lives might have been changed? Many. Preemptive action could have been taken. And again, look, that's the nature of progress. That's the way the world goes. I get that. But I do get this sense. And I think these things are particularly acute at the moment, you know, as you mentioned in the book, the Me Too movement, yeah. we've seen this year with the sort of racial tensions in America and around the world, but there's that theme of discrimination and unfairness and trying to create a more equal society. And mm -hmm. although you've written a health book to help women, actually, there's a political aspect to this as well. There's a, yes. you know, there really is. It's about equality and science, about not looking through the world. And I appreciate I'm a man saying this, but, you know, a no, very no. male-focused world. It's For, about yeah, but I, I think so everybody reacts this way, men and women. And nobody wants to treat women poorly. Nobody's aware yeah. that women are being discriminated in research. And I, I think... It doesn't take a scientist to denounce the fact that women's social, financial, and physical security remains inequitable. Not doing that. But it does take a scientist or a doctor to denounce the fact that women are also overlooked medically. 
where our needs go way too often unacknowledged and unaddressed, especially as far as our brains are concerned. Women's brain health remains one of the most under-researched, underdiagnosed, under-treated fields of medicine, and is really a direct consequence of the reductive understanding of what a woman is in the first place. And that I take personally, and I find it incredibly offensive. I talk about bikini medicine yeah. in the book, and I think it's, it's an interesting term that really speaks to the fact that historically, medical professionals and scientists truly believed that women were essentially smaller men with, with different reproductive organs. So from a medical standpoint, it was really like saying that the only thing that makes a woman a woman from a medical perspective is the reproductive organ, those parts of the body that you can cover under a bikini. And that means that women's health is inherently flawed and biased because all the attention is really about the reproductive organs. You go to a women's health doctor, they'll, they'll draw blood to check your hormones, they'll do a pap test to check your cervix for cancer. If you're over 40, 42, you get a mammogram to make sure your breasts are okay. And that's great. We should, we should, we should take care of all, we should take advantage of all those tests. It's incredible progress. But nowhere in the conversation are our brains mentioned. And I just want to, to clarify for context that Alzheimer's is only, Alzheimer's disease is just one part of a much bigger picture where women are twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or depression. We're three times more likely to develop an autoimmune disorder including those that attack the brain, like multiple sclerosis, were four times more likely to suffer, I'm going to underline suffer from headaches and migraines, were more likely, far more likely to develop a meningioma, which is the most common form of brain tumor, especially after menopause, and were far more likely to die of a stroke. And still, when we talk about women's health, we very specifically do not talk about our brain. Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. And, you know, as you were going through those statistics, which I, I am sure will be brand new information for a lot of my listeners and viewers, yeah. you, you can't help but thinking, if men were much more at risk of these things, I suspect we would know about them. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I, I want to make clear that whoever's listening to this or watching this on YouTube right now, this is a conversation that's relevant for all of us, men and women. Your book, yes. actually, Lisa, is relevant for men and women. You yeah, know, more women. No, but it is. It's kind of men need to know this. Because... <laughs> men need to know that. Yeah, no, the I book do, is it's... unapologetically for women. But I think it's so important for all men to be aware of these facts, right? Because it's never, it's never about women without men. It's never women against men or. or women instead of men. It just, that's not the point. Hey, I, really Lisa, I think about, men will enjoy this book. Yeah, honestly, I hope right? so. <laughs> I, no, because actually we've all got mothers, right? Yes, we we may have wise. daughters, we may have girlfriends, wives, we may have friends, yeah. Yeah. aunties. You know, it's not as if we live, you know, <laughs> we live in our silos as just men. No, we kind of, I think a lot of us would be super interested in learning, wow, the female brain is different. Yeah. Maybe this is going to help, if men read it, help them understand and have more, maybe more compassion for what a partner or a female yeah. friend might be going through at a particular time of life. Do you know what I mean? Okay. I think that's why it's so important for all of us. If you enjoyed that conversation, I really think you're going to enjoy the one I had with Professor BJ Fogg from Stanford, all about habits. It's right there. So give it a click and let me know what you think. The feeling of success is what wires in the habit emotions create habits and specifically in tiny habits what we focus on is 